message to the team? Good evening. I am Kevin Ahern, Chair of the Plan and Zoning Commission. I'd like to welcome you to tonight's virtual meeting and public hearing of the Town Planning and Zoning Commission. The required meeting agenda, application materials, and legal notice are all available on the town website. Because in-person attendance at public meetings is likely to increase the risk of transmission of COVID-19, this hearing is being meeting. conducted in accordance with Governor Lamont's <laughs> Executive Order Number 7B and Number 7I. Will the town planner please call the roll? Mr. Chairman, Town Planner Todd Dumay, Kevin Ahern, Chair. Here. Kevin Prestich is absent for the record. Michelle Mareska, she is absent for the record. John O'Donnell is absent for the record. Commissioner Gillette. Here. For the record, Commissioner Gillette is here. Her mic cut out. Commissioner Binkhorst. Remember to unmute yourselves when you speak. I'm here. Commissioner Binkhorst is here. Commissioner Gomes. Here. And Tom, may I am present. That is the role, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Dumay. Uh, this is Kevin O'Hearn, Chair again. For the record, I'd like to note that we have a full quorum of the commission. Also, I would like to note that Mr. Binkhorst and Ms. Gomes will be seated on all items. Commission members and town staff are participating via WebEx. Members of the public can view the meeting live on West Hartford Community Television or on West Hartford Community Interactive Comcast Channel 5 and Frontier TV Channel 6098 or at www.whctv.org. The meeting is also being recorded for on-demand viewing, which will be available on the town website. Because of the virtual format of this hearing, there are some special rules and procedures that I need to cover before I begin. First, I will ask all participants to please mute the microphones on your devices when you are not speaking. So we have a couple of microphones that are on right now. So if you could please mute those microphones. I'm still hearing noise. All right, I'll continue. Second, mm -hmm. pursuant to Executive Order 7B, all speakers must state their name and title each time they speak. Also, I will ask members of the commission and the applicant to not address other participants directly. Comments and requests for information must be made through the chair. After you state your name, simply preface your question or comment with through the chair. And when you are done, I will recognize the person who is the most appropriate to respond. Although these practices may feel rigid and awkward, they will ensure the meeting is conducted in an orderly fashion and that members of the public who are listening can understand the discussion. The first part of this meeting is a public meeting of the commission and not a public hearing. As such, public comment and testimony will not be received during these proceedings. The public hearing will convene at 7.15 p.m. or as soon thereafter as the matter may be heard. At that time, I will provide additional instructions for the special rules, conduct, and public access to the hearing. With that, Mr. Dumet, please proceed with the first item on our agenda. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is Mr. DeMay for the record. The first item on our agenda is actually all the way down at number eight. Uh, it's a town council referral, 1021-1023 Farmington Avenue, application on behalf of the Bridge Family Center, contract purchaser of property known as 1021-1023 Farmington Avenue, requesting a change of the underlying zone for approximately 0.21 acres of land on the south side of Farmington Avenue from RM3 multifamily residence to RO, Residence office and a special development district overlay designation for the reuse of the existing building for professional office use. TPC receipt and initial review on 3 2. Uh, as a reminder, and this is a referral from the town council, it did appear way back on our 
March meeting uh, at a time when we were doing in-person meetings, as strange as that might seem to some of you. Um, at the time, you were the first ones up in the process in terms of referral comments. Typically, our practice is the item will appear on your agenda for your referral finding for consistency with our plan of conservation and development later on in the process after our design review advisory committee has a chance to review and after staff review is further along and completed. So you were the first in the process. At that time, uh, the commission had indicated they, they were generally comfortable with the use of the RO zone change. However, they were uncomfortable with some of the aspects of the proposed SDD amendment and plan change. Specifically, there was a concern about the quantity of impervious coverage in parking areas being created, that it wasn't quite in keeping with the residential character, that there were too many mature trees and vegetation being removed without enough buffers, and you were interested in staff feedback on those issues along with the Design Review Advisory Committee. Since that time, the application has completed all staff reviews. There are no further technical comments. In addition, uh, Design Review Advisory Committee made a favorable referral, noting that this application um, is an appropriate response um, architecturally and both in site to this position on the Farmington Avenue corridor. Um, will the moderator please allow me to uh, have presenter access? Mr. Dumay, you do have presenter access. Thank you. So on the screen now, um, everyone, if you could just give me a thumbs up if you see a site plan that uh, is orange, green, and tan. Okay, I see thumbs up, good. Um, this, I think, is a, a representative image, and what this depicts is from the applicant. I asked them to share this. Um, you can see the driveway has a, a slight curve to it now. That curve was to protect the very two large mature trees along Farmington Avenue. They've reduced the width of the driveway down from um, by three feet. Uh, it's down to 17 feet. Um, there was significant buffers created on the south side of the property to preserve um, an existing stand of additional mature vegetation. There was a buffer area created along the western property boundary that did not exist when you were uh, doing your review. So everything you see there in green uh, indicates a, a change to towards pervious surface. Those are all grass. There is a little brick. I'm going to try my highlighter. There is a little brick pervious pavement areas that have been included. Uh, I highlighted both of those areas in red. Um, the areas in orange depict new impervious surface. So there are some parking expansions. Um, the areas in gray were existing impervious surface. So the net change to the overall site plan um, is about 600 square feet of new impervious surface. Um, so I think that this is responsive to um, the commission's prior review. And I do want to share one other image that makes it a little bit easier for everyone. So everyone should now see the site plan. You can see the driveway width. And this image has been reduced down to 17 feet at the, at the entrance. It's still 18 feet. That was at the request of our engineering division. Um, you should see the two large trees that I'm highlighting here with an arrow. Those were the mature trees that the commission asked if the applicant could preserve. In the back, I just highlighted three existing uh, mature trees that were also requested to be preserved. Um, and over here, along the western property boundary, there was additional plantings and the buffer width was increased to five feet. It was virtually non-existent or only two feet in the prior iteration of the plan. Uh, furthermore, sorry. Over here on this driveway, which is a shared driveway between the property 
immediately to the east of this, and there's a dentist office on Farmington Avenue. There's a shared driveway in which the driveway width is going to be reduced by seven feet. So this area of the property here um, is also subject to a reduction in pervious coverage. Uh, with that, I'm happy to answer any additional questions. Uh, one architectural change that was made uh, at the request of the Design Review Advisory Committee, uh, when you saw the original proposal, the architecture included a vinyl siding um, in the areas on the upper levels of the building above the EFIS. Uh, DRAC felt that it was a more appropriate historic response to have a wood shingle product. The applicant agreed to that, and the plans that were re-referred out to you include a vinyl um, apple, I'm sorry, they, they exclude the vinyl in favor of the traditional wood. Um, happy to answer any questions. And again, I'm sorry for what looks like a child's color drawing uh, on the site plan at this point, uh, but I hope you can all see that. Thank you. This is Kevin O'Hearn again. How is the uh, feedback on my audio? Are we getting any? Are we good? Okay. All right. It's so I see. I, Mr. Chairman. Sounds good. It's a bit staticky, Mr. Chairman. It is. Okay. We're going to remove. Um, everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. I see Liz Gillette. Uh, Chair recognizes Liz Gillette. I'm, I'm thrilled with the changes that were made. I'm absolutely thrilled that we're keeping the mature trees which re and narrowing the driveway, which really lends credence to the idea that it's residential office, not office looking like a house. And the, the cut down in the pervious surface in the back and the saving of the trees, I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful that the bridge was Kathy open Kutowski to these, has joined the to meeting. these suggestions. And uh, I was always in favor of the use. I am, I'm, I'm delighted with the changes that we made, and I hope they can serve as a model for changes in the future with other applications that are similar. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gillette. I think I saw Mr. Binkhorst. Did you have your, no, Mr. Binkhorst, no? Ms. Gomes, no? Okay, good. Uh, any other questions before we consider this? No? Okay, thank you, Mr. Dumay. Do you have anything further before we uh, entertain a motion on this item? Mr. Dumay, do you have anything further before we entertain a motion on this item? Mr. Chairman, I do not. Thank you. Okay. Um, I just want, I, I want to pause for a moment here because I, there's some question as to whether this is actually being broadcast to the public. Uh, Ms. Gomes, do you have a hand up? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. I was just on the, the broadcasting website and it is working on my end. I was just about to notify the commission. Yeah. It is working on my end. All right. Because uh, the link that I have is well, all right well if that's confirmed good let's keep going forward then uh, all right so mr demay nothing further on this item mr chairman this is mr demay nothing further on this item all right so uh for this item uh it would be a uh, we're going to entertain a motion it would be to either recommend or not recommend approval uh to the town council i'm sorry miss gomes if you could unmute your your microphone miss gomes mr chairman i'm so sorry i just the the link froze on the broadcasting and it is not broadcasting onto uh the link that we were provided it appeared to yeah. be working for a moment and now it's no longer working okay let's just pause because i do want to make sure the public can observe this before we take any right, votes so tim mr Cabello. chairman i'm requesting five minutes so that we can communicate with whci all right uh, so we're going to take a five minute pause uh, on uh, this year.
Kathy Kruskowski has left the meeting. Kathy Kruskowski has joined the meeting. David Peterson has joined the meeting. Yes. Kathy Pedro. David has joined the meeting. Mr. Chairman? Yes. I believe the problem has been resolved. We are okay to continue. All right, so uh, just so everybody understands before we go uh, live, I'm gonna have to go through my, my script again. I apologize uh, for everyone who's already heard that one time. Um, and what we're gonna do is instead of go to the, uh, uh, the item on Farmington Ave that we were just looking at, we're going to go right into the first uh, public hearing, the Kane Street uh, hearing, after I get done with all of my bloviating. Um, so I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning, and we're going to start this all over again. Um, thank you, Uriah. I am ready. Please proceed. Good evening. I am Kevin Hearn, Chair of the Town Planning and Zoning Commission. I'd like to welcome you to tonight's virtual meeting and public hearing of the Town Plan and Zoning Commission. The required meeting agenda, application materials, and legal notice are all available on the town website. Because in-person attendance at public meetings is likely to increase the risk of transmission of COVID-19, this hearing, this hearing is being conducted in accordance with Governor Lamont's Executive Order Number 7B and 7I. Will the town planner please call the roll? Mr. Chairman, this is the town planner, Kevin O'Hearn. Here. Commissioner Prestige, for the record, I'll note that he is absent. Commissioner Maresca, for the record, I'll note that she is absent. Commissioner O'Donnell, for the record, I'll note that he is absent. Commissioner Gillette. Here. For the here. record, Commissioner Gillette is here. Commissioner Binkerst. Here. Commissioner Gomes. Here. For the, rec for the record, I'll note Commissioner Gomes is here. And Todd DeMay, Tom Planner, present. Mr. Chairman, that is the roll. Thank you, Mr. DeMay. This is Kevin O'Hearn, Chair again. For the record, I'd like to note that we have a full quorum of the commission. Also, I will note that Mr. Binkhorst and Ms. Gomes will be seated on all items. Commission members and town staff are participating via WebEx. 
Members of the public can view the meeting live on West Hartford Community Television or on West Hartford Community Interactive Comcast Channel 5 and Frontier TV Channel 6098 or at www.whctv.org. The meeting is also being recorded for on-demand viewing, which will be available on the town's website. Because of the virtual format of this hearing, there are some special rules and procedures that I need to cover before I begin. First, I ask all participants to please mute the microphones on your devices when you are not speaking. Second, pursuant to Executive Order 7B, all speakers must state their name and title before they speak, each time. Also, I will ask members of the commission and the applicant to not address other participants directly. Comments and requests for information must be made through the chair. After you state your name, simply preface your question or your comment through the chair when you are done, I will recognize the person who is most appropriate to respond. Although these practices may feel rigid and awkward, they will ensure the meeting is conducted in an orderly fashion and that members of the public who are listening can understand the discussion. The first part of this meeting is a public meeting of the commission and not a public hearing. As such, public comment and testimony will not be received during these proceedings. The public hearing will convene at 7.15 p.m. or as soon thereafter as the matter may be heard. At that time, I will provide additional instructions for the special rules, conduct, and public access to the hearing. With that, Mr. Demang, please proceed with the first item on our agenda. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is Mr. Demang. Are we circling back to item number eight? Or are we going to jump into uh, the public hearing portion, seeing as the time is 7.23? Thank you, Mr. Demay. This is Kevin Ahern, Chair again. Uh, we are going to start directly into the public hearing and we will leave item number eight uh, where it is. So thank you. Uh, here I am again, Kevin Hearn, Chair of the Planning and Zoning Commission, and I'd like to welcome you to tonight's public hearing of the Town Plan and Zoning Commission on application 1123, 25 Kane Street. For the record, I'd like to note that the required meeting agenda, application materials, and legal notice are all available on the town website. Because in-person attendance at public meetings is likely to increase the risk of transmission of COVID-19, this hearing is being conducted in accordance with Governor Lamont's Executive Order Number 7B and Number 7I. With that, will the town planner please read the legal notice? West Hartford Plan and Zoning Commission legal notice. The Town of West Hartford Planning and Zoning Commission, also acting as the Inland Wetlands and Watercourse Agency, will hold a regular meeting at 7 p.m. on Wednesday, May 13th, 2020. Public hearings will convene at 7.15 p.m. or soon thereafter as the matter may be heard on the following. 25 Kane Street, application Inland Wetland 1123 of Thomas Evans, requesting approval of an Inland Wetland and Watercourse permit to conduct certain regulated activities which may have an adverse impact on a wetland and watercourse area. The applicant is proposing a restoration enhancement project in response to a notice of Inland Wetland and Watercourse violation issued by the designated agent for work without permits within a regulated area. The proposed activity takes place within a wetland, a watercourse, and adjacent 150-foot upland review area submitted for agency receipt on March 2nd, determined to be potentially significant and set for hearing on April 6th, meeting postponed and rescheduled to May 13th. At this hearing, interested persons may be heard in written comp communication received as outlined below. The application related to the item above is available for public review on the Town Planning and Zoning Commission website uh, under www.westhartfordct.gov, click on current TPZ agenda or by request via email to comment.tpz at westhartfordct.gov. The public hearings will be conducted exclusively as virtual meetings in accordance with the Town Planning and Zoning Commission rules and regulations for the transaction of business and executive orders 7B and 7I issued by Governor Ned Lamont. The public hearings will be broadcast live on television on West Hartford Community Interactive Comcast Channel 5 and Frontier TV Channel 6098 and streamed live at www.whctv.org. Any interested persons may participate in real time by calling 1-408-418-9388 and using the following access code 793-464-094 at 7.15 p.m. Participants using caller ID blocking will not be per to, permitted to participate. Participants will be called in the order in which their call was received when prompted by the chair and or moderator. 
participants will have the permission to speak on matters germane to the hearing. Any interested persons may submit written comment via email to comment.tpz at westhartfordct.gov. Written comments will be made part of the record on May 13th, 2020 public hearing and posted on the town's website. In order to be included as part of the record, comments must meet the following requirements. Comments must be received no later than 3.30 p.m. on May 13th. The subject of the email shall be applicant number, application number and address, TBZ May 13th public hearing. The body of the email must begin with the interested person's full name and street address. Comments must be germane to the application in no longer than 500 words. Posted on 429 on the town's website, Kevin Ahern, TPC Chair, IWW Chair, Todd Domain, Town Planner, Admin, Wetland Administrative Officer. For the record, I would also like to note in compliance with Executive Order 7I, that notice was post, posted on our website. In compliance with Executive Order 7IE, the posting of a sign was placed on the property and has been continuously monitored and checked. Uh, providing notice of this hearing. In addition, uh, in compliance with Executive Order 7IF, a mailing of direct abutters occurred, which also included all of the information read into legal notice, providing access information to this hearing. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, that is the notice. Thank you, Mr. Dumay. This is Kevin Hearn, Chair again. For the record, I'd like to note that we have a full quorum of the Commission. So, as promised, uh, because of the virtual meeting format, there are some special rules and procedures regarding hearings that I need to cover before we begin. First, phone access is only intended for members of the public who wish to actively participate and provide comments on the noticed application for 25 Kane Street in the Wetlands Application 1123. If you're interested in speaking on this item, please call 1-408-418-9388 and enter access code 793-464-094. Again, that's 408-418-9388 and enter access code 793-464-094. If you're on the phone and do not plan to speak, please hang up and watch live on television on West Hartford Community Interactive Comcast Channel 5, Frontier TV Channel 6098, or streaming at WHCTV. Org. Again, if you do not plan to comment, please hang up your phone now and instead listen to the hearing on TV or the internet. So for members of the public who are still on the phone, please do not mute your device. The meeting moderator will keep everyone's line muted until it is your turn to speak. If you mute your own line, the moderator may not hear your voice when she calls for comment. Second, I would like to describe the hand raising process. Unfortunately, our conference technology does not allow us to identify individual callers by name. So when the public comment portion of the meeting begins, the moderator will randomly unmute one call in line and ask everyone to say their name at the same time. The voice that we hear will belong to the person whose line is unmuted. That person will then be recognized by the moderator and asked to restate their name and provide their street address. We will repeat this process until we have unmuted every phone. It is very important that you say your name each time you are prompted by the moderator. If the moderator unmutes a phone line and does not hear a voice after the prompt, that phone line will be removed from the conference. If you have called in and are also streaming the meeting on YouTube or watching on TV, please silence your other device when you speak. Otherwise, there will be an echo because there is a slight delay in the television and streaming broadcast. Third, I ask that all speakers keep their comments brief and germane to the application. Obscene, offensive, or threatening language will not be tolerated. Anyone who violates this rule will receive a warning. And if the conduct continues, I will ask the moderator to mute that person's phone liner for the remainder of the meeting. If the violation is egregious, that person will be muted immediately. Fourth, for the public who has provided an opportunity to submit written comments on the application via mail and email, these comments have been published on the town's website as a PDF and are embedded in the online agenda. For the record, I will now read the names of all those who submitted written comments. I believe, Mr. DeMay, if I am correct, we have no written comments on this item. That is correct, Mr. Chairman. Okay. 
Thank you, Mr. Dumais. Again, this is Kevin O'Hearn. Members of the public are welcome to continue sending comments to comment.tbz at westhartfordct.gov. Again, that's comment, the word comment, dot tpz at westhartfordct.gov. And those comments will be distributed to the members of the commission and also read into the record. Finally, I would like to outline for all attendees the rules of engagement and how the commission operates a public hearing. First, those presenting or commenting should state their name and address for the record. Please spell your name. Commissioners may ask questions during the testimony of the applicant. All questions and comments will be directed through the chair and only after recognition by the chair, including follow-ups. If feasible, the chair will have the members hold their questions until the end of the applicant's presentation or the end of a logical break in the applicant's presentation. Following the testimony of the applicant, the public will have a chance to comment about the current application. Upon conclusion of the public's comments, the applicant will have an opportunity to address the opinions expressed. Upon conclusion of the applicant's rebuttal, and if there are no further questions from the commissioners, the public hearing will be closed. It is the practice of the commission to render a decision on an application the same night, following all items on the public meeting agenda. I would like to conclude by thanking everyone in advance for your patience. This is only our second virtual public hearing and we are still learning from experience. So there are bound to be some bumps and glitches along the way, but remain committed to the principles of open and transparent government. So with that, will the applicant please proceed with their presentation? Mr. Chairman, uh, if I may, Todd DeMay, Town Planner for the record before the applicant yes. online, I'd just like to correct one statement um, we have four members of the commission present, not a full quorum, but a quorum none, nonetheless. I uh, just want to note that for the record. Um, and once the applicant is ready, if you would just let the moderator know to um, have them share screen and make me the presenter. And with that, I'll turn it over to the applicant. Todd, can you hear me? Hello, Todd? Yes, we can hear, we can hear you, Mr. Smith. I think you can hear me now, right? I'm not sure. Perfect, thank you. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the Wetlands Agency, Mr. DeMay and Madam Clerk. For the record, my name is Chris Smith, S-M-I-T-H. I'm a land use attorney with the law firm of Alter and Pearson. The address for the firm is 701 Peter Avenue in Glastonbury. And I just one uh, quick housekeeping matter is I did provide uh, Mr. Dumay with uh, copies of the notice letters that I sent out to the Connecticut DPH, as well as the MDC, as provided by Section 22A42F. Uh, I, we don't believe we're in a watershed or over a designated watershed, but just out of uh, overcautiousness, I always send the notices out uh, for whatever hearing I have. Uh, in whether it's zoning or wetlands. So I just wanted to indicate that for the record and that is part of the file. Uh, second, I certainly would uh, prefer to be doing this in person with everyone there, uh, but we do appreciate the opportunity to go forward with this matter uh, through this uh, virtual process and thank you. <clears throat> I appear before you this evening on behalf of the owner applicant Thomas Evans concerning an application requesting approval of regulated activities associated with a proposed wetlands enhancement and restoration plan that has been submitted in response to a notice of violation that was issued concerning certain conduct or activities performed at 25 Kane Street without first having obtained a wetlands permit approval from this agency. Now at the outset, with permission of the chair, I would just like to introduce the members of the team I believe that the owner applicant, my client, Tom Evans, is on the phone. I know that we had some audio issues. Uh, he and Martin Brogy, uh, Brogy, Martin Brogy Inc. Environmental Services, uh, who is our certified soil scientist, as well as a licensed environmental professional, LEP, as part of the team. And they were in, in the same venue. I'm not sure if uh, Mr. Evans is on, but I know that uh, Mr. Brogy is because he will be doing most of the presentation to the agency this evening. We also have as a member of our team, William Walter, who's a licensed professional engineer, LEDAP, senior project manager with uh, Banesh, and uh, you'll be hearing from him in a uh, short while. 
of the format for our presentation, I'm going to provide a very brief overview, and then I'll turn the uh, floor over to Martin Brogy, who again is our soil scientist and licensed environmental professional. Uh, Mr. Brogy is going to review the wetlands ass assessment and enhancement or restoration plan for you. During his presentation, uh, William Walter will step in. He's our engineer and he will address the erosion and sediment control plan implementation component of the enhancement or restoration plan. And then we'll just wrap up with our, our brief conclusion. For the overview, and uh, Mr. Dumay, if we could have that, the first slide of the PowerPoint, I, I believe has the aerial on it. Beautiful, thank you. I would uh, respectfully refer the agency to the aerial on slide number one of our presentation. Now this aerial was taken from September of 2019. And this is after the activities uh, occurred that generated the notice of violation. So this aerial essentially depicts existing conditions at the site, albeit there was foliage at that time and the foliage is just starting to come back at this juncture, this point in time. The subject property is approximately 2.67 acres in size. Uh, north is to the top of the aerial and north uh, the, uh, at the northern end or adjacent to the property at fronts Kane Street. On the opposite side of Kane Street, is, uh, Kane Street at your, as you're probably aware, there's a shopping center uh, with the uh, recently closed ShopRite store. Directly to the south, the property abuts I-84 to the west there's an exit ramp from I-84. And if you go to the east, you see Prospect Avenue and the property, and you'll see this a little bit further when Mr. Brogy is doing his presentation, the property is actually a, an L uh, that ta uh, tails off to Prospect Avenue. So the southeastern part of the property abuts Prospect Avenue, and then the northeastern side of the property actually abuts what's shown on the, you see the, there's a gas station there at the intersection of Prospect and Kane. So I would respectfully submit that, uh, and I think anyone could easily determine that the subject property is certainly located in an urbanized setting uh, or neighborhood. Now the property recently accommodated a D'Angelo's restaurant that was closed approximately one and a half years ago. Initially, the restaurant was a Roy Rogers that appears to have been approved in 1983 or 1984. And the Kane Brook, uh, traverses the property. And this has been altered over the years to provide flood, store, flood storage capacity. Again, Mr. Brogy will address these issues in more detail during his presentation, but I was hoping to just provide you with a, a little overview of the property uh, from a um, orientation standpoint. Now, as I indicated uh, last year, uh, Mr. Evans performed certain activities on the subject property that required a wetlands permit. He had not obtained one. That was in the summer of last year. A notice of violation was issued by Mr. Dumay. It was dated September 4, 2019. Mr. Evans immediately ceased any activity at the site. He contacted and worked with Mr. Dumay and retained a soil scientist and engineer to install, install soil and erosion control measures to stabilize the site at that time. Now, Mr. Dumay indicated that he wanted to see a wetlands permit application be applied for. Uh, the client, my client was, had no intention of challenging any order. He understood the situation. Uh, the client, uh, Mr. Evans, did indicate to Mr. DeMay that there were a couple of potential tenants interested in the vacant site or the vacant store, restaurant, excuse me, at this point. Uh, and Mr. DeMay indicated that uh, he, he recommended that we hold off on filing a wetlands permit that would include the restoration plan that you have before you this evening until we were able to confirm whether we were going, to, were going to be securing a tenant for the site. And in that case, if there were additional regulated activities, that it would be best to come in with both applications or both items being addressed at one time with the agency. And that's because Mr. DeMay was satisfied, I believe, I don't want to speak for Mr. DeMay, uh, that the uh, site had been stabilized. Now, I just would like to, uh, so that's, that's why there was a little delay between the notice of violation being issued and then the filing of this wetlands application. 
Yeah, I just would like a, a quick comment, if I may. I, I've known my client for a number of years, and I've always found Mr. Evans to be very conscientious, sometimes to a fault. However, the ball was certainly dropped in this situation, and for that, Mr. Evans does sincerely apologize to the agency. But hopefully you'll see that with the proposal this evening, uh, we firmly believe that if approved, the restoration plan will restore and enhance the property's wetlands in Canebrook while simultaneously maintaining the components of the restaurant site development uh, plan that was approved apparently back in 1983, 1984, that provided for flood maintenance control along the Cane uh, Brook. So with that, Mr. Chairman, if I may turn the floor over to Mr. Brogy, who will walk you through with the PowerPoint presentation, uh, his uh, wetlands assessment and enhancement and restoration plan that's been submitted in support of this application. Thank you. Uh this is Kevin Ahern, the chair again. Uh, to the extent that you guys are moving from one person to another within your team, I'm not. You don't need to to, to run through me, but I appreciate it. Um, Sorry, uh, you just doing that's that. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, it, so uh, please proceed. I think Mr. Brogy's up next time. Good evening. Thank you. This is Martin Brogy. Can everyone hear me all right? Thank you. Um, my name is Martin Brogy. I'm a soil scientist with the Soil Science Society of Southern New England and a Connecticut licensed environmental professional. I've been working as an environmental consultant for 30 years this October. And primarily my work is focused on the state of Connecticut and several of the New England states surrounding Connecticut. But Probably 95% of my work has been here in here in Connecticut. Um, and it's a pleasure to be before all of you tonight. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. We've been looking forward to it for several months. Todd, can you proceed to the next slide, please? Thank you. Again, uh, my name is Martin Brogy. I'm a soil scientist in a Connecticut LEP. Uh, my CAD designer is Kevin Hazel, who worked with me on the initial designs that we submitted to the town of West Hartford uh, when the initial notice of violation came through and the call uh, went up for a restoration plan. Um, when we received our initial town comments, uh, we engaged uh, Banesh uh, out of our, uh, their Glastonbury office. Uh, Will Walter I've worked with for quite a number of years on multiple projects and Will worked on the erosion sedimentation control plan and I worked with their landscape architect, Joshua Egnatz, to produce the uh, site uh, uh, restoration plan, as we'll see in the, moving forward. So uh, next slide, please. Mm -hmm. um, again, I, to echo some of the Chris's comments, I want to talk about my relationship with Mr. Evans, the property owner. Uh, I've known Tom for nearly 30 years, almost my entire career. Uh, we've worked on many projects throughout Connecticut, including wetland restoration uh, plans and uh, site development plans. Um, he is, as, as Chris said, uh, very conscientious. He exercises a very high standard of care and concern over each and every one of his properties. He caters to national tenants, and uh, he's very fastidious about taking care of his properties. Uh, from snow removal to landscaping uh, to making sure his tenants receive everything that they need uh, and doesn't take any risks with regard to uh, his on-site tenants once they're engaged. He, he, I often hear him talking about making sure he gets up early in the morning if there's going to be ice and to spread salt and so forth. So uh, he's very, very conscientious. He's not a fly-by-night guy. Uh, he's also not a big corporation that operates from some desk in another part of the country. He's a Connecticut uh, resident. Uh, and a responsible citizen. I, I thought it was important to, to convey those facts. Next slide, please. Um, with regard to the recent conduct on the site, uh, we wanted to walk through just some of Tom's thought process, not to justify uh, the activity with regard to not obtaining a permit first. Um, the area was grossly uh, unmanaged and very overgrown with a lot of invasive species. Um, some very fast growing tree species were out there. Um, the Connecticut Department of um, Transportation recognized uh, the overgrown condition um, and Tom engaged them uh, to uh, take the responsibility and the cost for removing uh, 
um, an extensive overgrown area along the western portion of his property, including the DOT-owned fence that was uh, overgrown and, and basically torn down by invasive vines. Um, Tom, at his own expense, went in and cleared the, the, the trees and vines, invasive species, and then installed a fence along that western property boundary to give it a much uh, a cleaner look um, when, when looking at the site. Um, and uh, putting a nice fence up there uh, along uh, Prospect Avenue um, where cars go by, many, many cars per day, um, trash, needles, diapers, um, glass are thrown out of the car windows and go down that slope that's very overgrown. It's very hard to manage. So that area was cleared and um, trash was pulled out of there. Um, there were numerous, uh, I think, three homeless encampments in that wooded area uh, just south of the brook. Um, people coming and going, uh, vast amounts of trash in there. Um, it was, uh, it was a, a hazard in, in Tom's eyes, and, and he couldn't see bringing in a national tenant to that location with that sort of activity going on. Um, and so he, he cleared um, the area where those encampments were, cleared along a sewer right-of-way that runs south of the brook that I'll discuss later, and then moved uh, certainly way too close to the brook um, and along the regulated area. Um, when this was observed by the town, a notice of violation was issued, um, and he ceased immediately, engaged uh, an engineering firm to uh, scope out installation of erosion sedimentation control barriers uh, along the brook, uh, and then proceeded with uh, wetland delineation and assessment of the area uh, by engaging myself. Next slide, please. Um, here again is the aerial view that we saw on that first slide. This again is a, a view from, from September 2019 after the removal of woody vegetation was conduct, conducted north and south of the brook. Um, the site's 2.7 acres. Um, the northern one acre portion of the site, as you can see, has uh, uh, the recently vacated D'Angelo's restaurant and the paved parking area surrounding it. It's approximately an acre that was developed in the mid 80s. Um, beneath that, running from uh, Kane Street um, north to south is a 60-inch uh, reinforced concrete pipe storm drain that we'll discuss later. From west to east across the belly of the property is Kane Brook, going from underneath the highway off-ramp over to Prospect Avenue. Um, it enters the site via a 13 by 7 foot box culvert and exits via a 11 by 13 foot box culvert. The 18-inch uh, sewer main uh, parallels Cane Brook to the south, running west to east, and then it splits, uh, running underneath the adjacent gasoline station to the north and, and under Prospect Avenue to the east. Um, there's a fill slope, uh, pretty steep fill slope, about three to one, coming off of Prospect Avenue that was uh, filled in by the Department of Transportation to get Prospect Avenue over the constructed highway in 1960, uh, about 65, as we'll see on the next slide. Next slide, please, Todd. Um, we wanted to give you a historical perspective of this property to understand um, its roots and oranges with regard to uh, the level of disturbance and uh, the original um, uh, construction in and around this property and how it was designed to essentially be a stormwater conveyance from north to south and east to west. This is a 1970 aerial photograph that was taken after uh, Interstate I-84 was constructed, including the off-ramp. Um, you can see Prospect Avenue on the east side, um, and on, along the west side of Prospect Avenue, you can see a very light-colored uh, material, which is fill. It's, it's thinner uh, toward the north and gets thicker uh, as you move toward the highway. It's about 20 feet of fill material along that slope um, from the base of the site on the south um, to the level uh, street uh, on Prospect Avenue. So it's quite a considerable amount of fill, fill material that was brought into that flood area. Um, and you can see Cane Brook passing from west to east across the middle, mid portion of the site. Um, historically, uh, naturally, it was a, it was a, a meandering stream. Um, and the DOT, when they came in and did their construction, elevating prospects and building the off-ramp, um, widened and straightened out Cane Brook uh, across the site and culverted it. Um, in the middle of the site, uh, on the north side, you can see a a deeply incised uh, channel, which is a, a ditch that was created by DOT to convey stormwater 
from the north side of Cane Brook in and around the ShopRite Plaza down through the site into Cane Brook. And then uh, just east of the off ramp, you can see another smaller ditch that conveys uh, some storm water from the north side of Cane Brook, just a couple of catch basins in the north side of, uh, of uh, Cane Street um, were created to convey storm water through that little ditch to the west end of Cane Brook um, across the site. So this just gives you the historic perspective of what the, what the site looked like um, in an association with uh, the highway construction um, and its original purpose as, a, as essentially a stormwater conveyance. Next slide, please. Um, in the mid 1980s, uh, Roy Rogers came in and developed the property. Um, it was owned by Texaco, um, that gas station uh, at the junction of Kane and Prospect uh, was constructed first. Texaco owned the property. Um, they sold off a portion of it to Roy Rogers and Roy Rogers came in and built a 2,900 square foot uh, store and associated parking area. Uh, in doing so, um, they filled in uh, a portion of what was delineated as a, a, a flood storage area. Um, and with the permitting uh, permission of the town of West Hartford and association with the Greater Hartford Flood Control Commission, um, they developed a permitted site on that property, um, which basically consists of the current site improvements. Um, since they were occupying and filling in some of the flood storage capacity of Cane Brook, um, the Flood uh, Commission required them to conduct a compensatory cut along the south side of Cane Brook. Um, Todd, if you can point to that area, um, uh, it's basically in the northern, uh, or I'm sorry, the upper portion of the slide um, on the Roy Rogers site plan. Um, you can see Cane Brook across the site going from east to west. And just on the south side of that, or the upper portion of the slide, um, there's a cut, and it's labeled as a compensatory cut. And that was created, uh, yeah, that's the aerial photograph from 1986 that shows um, uh, the cleared area, but actually just further south of that, Todd, further up, um, uh, there it is, you're doing it, that's it. So that area was the compensatory cut um, where they came in and removed um, essentially fill material from alongside of the relocated Cane Brook to offset the flood storage that was um, occupied by the construction of um, the Roy Rogers uh, parking area and building. In the course of doing that, they also took that large northern uh, ditch that came from Cane Street down to Cane Brook and culverted that into a 60-inch pipe. Um, the town of West Hartford uh, had an easement over that pipe in the outfall area to maintain it. So again, this just gives you the background of the development of the site and, and hopefully conveys the understanding that the brook uh, and, the, and, the, and the development of that site in the mid 80s um, uh, were created largely to serve as the primary function of that wetland as a flood control capacity. Next slide, please. So in early September, I was called in to uh, perform the uh, wetland delineation of the site as a soil scientist. Um, obviously the primary um, wetland uh, feature of the site is Cane Brook. Um, I've been observing Cane Brook from September 5th, actually up until today. And uh, every day there has been water uh, flowing through Cane Brook. Uh, Tom has advised me that even in July, in very dry periods, there is some trickle going through there. Obviously it is a perennial water course. Um, it's got a pretty large watershed as it um, meanders its way um, further to the west and under the highway and through some residential neighborhoods um, in West Hartford. Um, and it, it certainly would be considered a perennial water course. Um, it's an altered perennial water course in an urban environment. Um, it does um, obviously take on significant um, flood flows from storm events. It's very flashy. Uh, within minutes after a storm event, there will be a lot of water moving through the system. When it came to the wetland delineation, I did identify some poorly drained soils as a result of saturation uh, adjacent to the brook, as well as some floodplain soils um, from numerous flood events that went through there, and then used uh, microtopography to evaluate um, an appropriate wetland boundary in there that captured 
Um, 95% of the flood events that go through here, all of the wetland soils and certainly every bit of cane brook. Um, what was interesting to me, um, just a couple of months ago, we did observe some fish in Cane Brook over toward the east side um, near the culvert under Prospect Avenue. Um, the brook is a bit deeper there. Uh, the central and western parts of the brook are largely filled with road sand uh, and debris. Uh, there are some deeper pockets over on the east end, and there were some uh, small fish uh, in there. So that was a kind of an interesting find and 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 uh, uh, certainly is worth mentioning with regard to the wetland characterization value up there. As far as the stream bottom goes, there are no submerged or emergent, emergent aquatic vegetation in there. Uh, it's sand, it's concrete, there's asphalt, there's furniture, concrete, uh, brick. Uh, in fact, when I was digging test pits, uh, looking at the topsoil uh, depth, uh, just about every test hole, there were brick fragments there. So the cane brick factory, uh, and, and, the, and the clays uh, certainly play into one another. So this is, a, again, an urban disturbed environment. Um, and so the, the stream bottom is not exactly uh, one that you would find uh, rich with benthic organisms or, or uh, a lot of organic uh, interplay with uh, living organisms that might uh, utilize that stream. It's, a, it's an urban stream by every, every stretch of the imagination, but it was nice to see the fish in there. Um, as far as vegetation goes, um, certainly it's a it's a floodplain area, not too far from the Park River, and certainly in the Connecticut River Valley, you're going to get a lot of cottonwood seeds adrift uh, in the air, um, and they take root very quickly and grow very quickly. Um, there were many cottonwood stumps out there. Uh, it's a, it was a cottonwood floodplain, more or less, um, if you had to characterize it as a as a wetland, as well, in addition to um, some willows. Um, I did find some traces of elderberry brush out there as well. Um, but in addition, as you can see from this photo, there's Japanese knotweed out there, um, invasive vines, bittersweet, poison ivy, um, very overgrown urban uh, type environment. But essentially the primary function of this wetland through the site uh, is for flood control in an urban environment, but it does provide some wildlife habitat um, and some wildlife uh, food sources. Next slide, please. Um, we did want to discuss the, the wetland impacts from the activity that occurred back in August. Um, certainly the primary impact was the removal of, of vegetation from along the brook in the regulated area. Um, uh, the, the shrub layer and, and tree layer, much of it was removed. You can see in this aerial photograph, um, uh, much of the woody vegetation was, was taken out from along those areas that you can see pretty clearly in this photograph. Um, there wasn't uh, uh, any significant soil erosion that we could really see out there, no wheel ruts, uh, no over, overland flows that were introducing soil into the brook or the wetlands. Hydrology wasn't disturbed. Um, there was no reduction in impediments to flow. Um, in fact, some restrictions to flow were actually removed from the brook. Um, so overall, I think we can qualify that uh, the impacts of the wetlands here were certainly some removal of, of, of wildlife habitat in terms of shelter. There were, wasn't a lot of wildlife food value here. Um, and the other impact is really um, where an overhead canopy to a stream in an urban environment like this might mitigate some thermal impacts uh, from stormwater running off of paved areas um, that might be heated um, from the sun and then warm water would be flowing through the system. Um, that might be cooled by by a shaded uh, stream bed. Um, so th those are certainly basically the the essential elements of the impacts of the site. Um, but we can certainly categorize those as being temporary impacts in that we uh, can restore the canopy over the stream. Next slide, please. Uh, I'll turn this over to Will uh, through the chair, if I may, just to talk about this uh, this slide. Thanks, Martin. Thanks. Can everybody hear me? Okay, for the record, Will Walter, professional engineer with Alfred Benish and Company. And as Martin had uh, stated, 
we were brought in as a response to the, um, the comments that the town had um, from the original erosion control plan. And, and basically um, our charge was to design an erosion control plan that met the 2002 Connecticut DEP erosion control guidelines. And that's what we've done. Um, so we visited the site and um, the silt fence that Mr. Evans had originally put up was in good condition. It is in good condition. So we're proposing to leave that there. We're proposing to enhance that by adding some straw waddles between the fence and the stream right on the top of the stream bank to make sure that, um, that no erosion gets down in the stream. The treatment of the slope on the Prospect Avenue uh, side of the property, um, the, the trees have been cut, the stumps are in place. We're gonna remove, we're gonna cut the stumps, but we're proposing to leave the stumps and the root system in place. And that's gonna be important because if those things are pulled up, then it's gonna create a lot of disturbance and potentially a lot of erosion. So we're gonna leave the root system in place. Uh, we're proposing to scarify the top half inch or inch and then come in with an erosion control seed mix um, that's gonna take and really stabilize and, and help stabilize that slope. Um, we're proposing a temporary stream crossing of timber uh, beams. That's per the erosion control guidelines. The stumps that are remaining on the site, similar to the hill, we're going to cut them uh, flush, but we're going to leave them in place and then remove all the, the rubbish and the trash and the, and the brush that is currently out there. So it'll be cleaned up nicely. Um, and then we'll possibly reuse, uh, reutilize some of the wood chips for mulch, uh, but remove the bulk uh, from the stream side. Um, so this plan was presented as a part of the recent application. Uh, it was reviewed by town staff, and to my knowledge, there's been um, there's been no comments from uh, from town staff uh, on the plan. Thank you. Uh, thank you. This is Kevin O'Hearn again, uh, the chair. I just want to, uh, so uh, just to clarify, and I guess uh, go back to uh, to council, uh, Attorney Smith, uh, is there anything further on this application? Uh, Martin, I'm not sure if you're through with the presentation yet, are you? We can't hear you. Hear me? Here we go. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted Will to take that slide um, because, uh, you know, Vinesh came in and, and developed the, uh, the erosion and sedimentation control in response to staff comments. Um, and so I wanted you to see his face. Uh, I know that we had the engineer on the case um, uh, in that we took uh, staff comments sincerely um, the first time around and, and brought in Vinesh to, to provide those engineering services. Um, and landscape architecture services to present a nice plan um, um, for the agency. Um, so on this next slide, um, certainly one of the really important factors on this site in terms of wetland restoration um, is the removal of invasive species. I mean, this site um, uh, is bound by roadways on all sides and um, has a stream that flows through the middle of it um, and, and seeds get deposited in these disturbed areas uh, and, and the invasive species seeds get spread by birds, by water courses, and by the actions of man um, very easily across the site. And um, we have uh, a site that is just ripe for invasive species and it's created havoc on this site in the past in spite of some of the wonderful tree species that have come in um, colonized here, uh, the invasives have really uh, wreaked havoc. So it's it's very, very important as we move forward with a restoration plan that's going to last into the future that we control the invasive species and keep the vines off the trees and keep the uh, bamboo uh, away from our uh, herbaceous vegetation um, and that we can get our native species to take hold. So uh, primarily it's the, the common actors, multiflora rose, bittersweet poison ivy and Japanese bamboo. Uh, are located here. Uh, they will be tagged uh, and identified in the field. Um, they will be removed by hand and by shovel, um, and they will be um, composted on site. We have to be very careful with knotweed. Um, 
one small piece of a rhizome can turn into a new plant and a new colony. So uh, it's a really uh, uh, important stewardship of this material to compost it on site. We will lay it inside uh, heavy plastic sheeting, cover it with plastic sheeting, and that's where that will be located until it's fully decomposed, and then we can use it as humus compost um, in other areas of the site. So we just want to let you know that we're, we're taking that very seriously. We're going to be moving everything by hand, stockpiling it, composting it on site. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the wetland restoration planting um, is proposed for the site. It consists of uh, insulation of 22 native trees, um, 68 uh, native shrubs, uh, and three different seed mixes. Uh, we've selected uh, uh, three uh, floodplain type species, species that we see on the site and or that we think will be suitable for the site, including cottonwood, sycamore, uh, and black willow. Um, I've highlighted black willow in yellow because previously we had uh, weeping willow on our site plans. Um, we'd like to substitute that in with black willow because it's a more, it's a native species, frankly, uh, and more suited to the site. We include some uh, upland habitat enhancement as well. Um, it makes no sense to enhance wetlands when you're not enhancing the adjacent uplands as well, when you have such an opportunity as we have here with sort of an uncarved or a blank slate, if you will. Um, so we're integrating wetland and upland plantings that are all native, uh, including shrubs and trees. Um, down in the wetlands, we're planting uh, 58 different shrub species, 58 different plants, six different species, including facultative and facultative wetland species. Uh, the fact species will go on the middle uh, of the slope uh, and more on the flats uh, just above the, uh, the stream. And the fat wet species will get closer to the uh, water course where it's a little bit wetter. All six of the uh, wetland species and the upland shrub species are all berry producers. Um, they're uh, wildlife friendly, obviously, uh, in terms of their uh, wildlife food availability. They also are excellent stream stabilizers. They have root systems that uh, um, send shoots and, and, and rhizomes and sprouts out. Uh, Multi-stemmed um, shrubs uh, will also ensure uh, shoreline uh, or stream stabilization. Um, so we'll have a nice dense shrub layer uh, that provides uh, wildlife food and streamside stabilization. Uh, we focused more on the shrubs, um, perhaps in the trees. With 22 trees plus the existing tree layer out there, we feel that will be good shade uh, over the stream and provide good habitat um, for birds and other species. Um, and the shrubs will provide a really strong uh, lower uh, tier for stream stabilization and wildlife habitat. The three seed, we selected three seed mixes here, uh, including uh, sort of an erosion control, uh, moist site uh, restoration that includes all native species. Uh, a wildflower seed mix for the open area on the middle of the site, and then some conservation wildlife seed mix uh, for the sloping areas of the site along Prospect and along the DOT uh, right away hillside. Next slide, please. Um, our uh, greenhouse uh, uh, provider is uh, New England Wetland Plants Inc. out of Amherst, Mass. Uh, we spoke with them last week. They have all the woody plants uh, available, um, and they provide all the seed mixes. They, they are famous for their New England wet mix that just about everybody uses in the state uh, for wetland restoration. Their seed mixes are fantastic because they contain such a wide variety of native seeds um, that can really take hold in just about any environment. Um, if you have uh, situations where you have some areas that are wetter than others, um, the seed mixes will, will take hold in areas um, that are more suited for the particular individual seeds in that mix. So you'll have uh, maybe eight or 10 different uh, particular seeds, you know, whether it's rye or um, uh, black eyed Susans or, or, or wool grass, depending on the, the hydrologic strata that you're placing these seeds, um, they, they will take hold. Um, and give you a nice native uh, array based on uh, essentially soil moisture regimes. We're proposing to, to commence our woody plant installations in the fall. Uh, right now we're looking at mid-May. 
Um, we're looking at a, an approval process. Uh, we need to go in and still finish clearing the site of the brush, the logs, the wood chips, do some raking, some invasive species removals. Um, and uh, frankly, the woody vegetation has a better chance of achieving success with a fall planting. So our goal is to go in there in the fall and conduct our woody vegetation plantings uh, and use the summer for clearing the site and making it ready and making it suitable. We have to understand that this site is a, a heavy clay soil. These are the Hartford clays, silts and clays um, that are abound in the area. Um, and, and they can be difficult in terms of installations for, for woody plants. Uh, so we've got to uh, uh, take extra care uh, and, and hand dig all of our woody vegetation installations. We've got to make a saucer shaped hole about three times the size of our root ball. We've got to scarify the bottom and sides of those uh, uh, excavations. And uh, we're gonna augment our planting soil with 20 to 30% peat moss to make sure that the moisture is retained. Uh, we do have a water source uh, with the building on site. We'll be watering weekly throughout the fall until these uh, plants go dormant. And hopefully in the spring, um, with spring weather, they'll have a good chance to take off. Next slide, please. Uh, and lastly, um, we wanted to ensure the agency and the town um, that we're gonna be closely monitoring our installations and that we're guaranteeing 100% survival of all the woody vegetation on this site uh, within three years. Twice a year, we're gonna be providing a report um, to the town, uh, just a quick, uh, Mr. Brogy, if you could just take a minute, you are buffering. We need to get you back. So we will stand in recess while we get the applicant back. Thank you. Logging, the removal of the invasive species, the invasive species removal activity, the composting activity, and then the following season, whether it's spring or fall, what we see. Mr. Brogy, Mr. Brogy, let me just interrupt very quickly. You buffered for about 30 seconds. Uh, so maybe just go back and, and just review maybe the last 30 seconds first, just, just to make sure we got it. Okay, so I want to make sure that everybody knows that each woody plant will be established uh, a number. Um, okay, good. Uh, so we're going to monitor each woody plant twice a year to make sure that they're surviving. If not, we'll replace them. We're going to give you reports twice a year. In addition to the woody plants, we're going to be monitoring the invasive species. So you'll know what we identify on the site every season, um, spring and fall, what activities we do in terms of removals, how our composting is looking, um, and they, again, uh, you know, a final site uh, review in terms of what we have maybe emerging in the following spring. Um, so you can be sure that the uh, invasive species have been properly addressed. So again, three years of, of monitoring and reporting to the town and the agency, both spring and fall, to follow up on the plan. Um, and that concludes our presentation. Maybe we can go back to the, here's the um, planting plan, but I think maybe we can go to the first slide that shows the overview of existing conditions. Uh, uh, Chairman. This is uh, Kevin on the chair again. Uh, I'm gonna recognize council. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the record, Chris Smith of Walter and Pearson. Uh, I did submit the resumes of Mr. Brogy and Mr. Walter uh, for the record and, and for the agency's review. I didn't submit anything about myself, but uh, I, I had the pri privilege of serving on a municipal wetlands agency for 13 years and the Connecticut General Assembly's in the wetlands task force back in, in the 90s. And I understand that we all frown upon work that's done without the appropriate permits, and in particular with wetlands. I mean, wetlands are important, we know that. Uh, I just would like to say again that my client, I believe I respectfully submit, is uh, good people, he apologizes. And uh, we do hope in closing that the agency may consider acting favorably upon this wetlands enhancement and restoration plan that, um, albeit after the work, will probably 
have a uh, significant positive impact in the wetlands on this site. So in closing, uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to appear this evening. And I would like to thank uh, your professional staff and in particular your town planner, uh, Todd Dumay, for working uh, with us uh, to get to this point. And uh, we'll field any questions that you or the public may have. And thank you again. Uh, this is Kevin Ahern, the chair again. Thank you, Attorney Smith. I appreciate it. Uh, so we're going to turn over to questions from the commission. I believe I saw uh, Commissioner Gilles' hand up. Uh, please take it away. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Liz Gillette. Um, I, I just would like to note for the record that, in order to point out to my fellow commissioners, because this slide has come back up, slide one, um, slide one, slide five, and slide nine are the same overview which was taken, which is very helpful. But I just would like the commissioners to notice that the darker areas, which make up about a third of the picture, are shadows. They are not vegetation. So the impression given might, I don't think it's intentional, it's the time of day. But I just wanted to point out that there's a great deal of shadow in the picture. Yeah. Um, one of the things that very, very much impressed me about this application was the three-year follow-up and the reporting. And I think it's something that we might all find very useful for other applications for Arba Vita that, that traditionally die in our hands, coming back for three years to make sure it lives. And I, I, I do very much appreciate that. I'd like a little clarification on the Prospect Avenue um, easterly slope, which as you say, is quite, quite steep. I thought I read in the application that your, your proposal was to cover that with landscape fabric and chips. And then did I hear tonight that it will be a erosion seed mix? It didn't strike me that chips would stay on that kind of slope anyway, but could you clarify that for me? Please. Uh, this is Kevin Hart in the chair again. Uh, Mr. Brogy, are you the best one to answer that? Please unmute. Yes, thank you. That's a that's a good it's a good point. Yes, in our original application, uh, we had proposed utilizing uh, wood chips along that slope. Um, that's a common practice. Uh, DOT uses it throughout the highway. Um, but when we engaged uh, our engineer uh, from Banesh and um, followed the town protocols for the 2002 erosion control plan, um, we, we, it was noted that um, putting wood chips on the landscaping fabric, it, it may not hold up. Um, and so we decided the best thing to do was to, was to, uh, was to seed it um, and scarify it and seed it and, and allow it to, to grow naturally. Thank you. I, 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 I think, I think you're right. Um, I think that is probably going to work better. In your planting schedule, you do talk about mowing um, some of the seeded areas. How would you get a mower across down and across the brook to mow? <laughs> Yes, um, we've looked at that pretty closely. There's there's a, a, a way through behind the guardrail um, above the culvert at Prospect Street. It's a little steep, um, but you can get down that way. Thank you. Um, one of the, the things, and I, I just would like sort of your permission, I will be asking it later. <clears throat> In, in the application that I received, there are two, I think two, at least two references to figure number two. And I think with Mr. DeMay's help, I figured out that not having a figure number two, that it came in through in our plans in the planting plan C-2.1. Is that correct? 
Yes, in the original report, um, the figure two was the previous planting plan. Okay, it, it, it's just that it, you go back and, well, you go back and reference that you will be um, referring to the planting plans, and I just wanted to make sure that we, um, in the, the final the final thing, that those two terms matched up. Um, that was pretty much all I had to say about this, except that the, the history and the background was very helpful and very informative. Um, we had not been made aware up until I read this anyway, with the previous communications about the floodplain function. And, and that makes a lot of sense with what you see there. And uh, I, I really do appreciate that. It, um, one of your oldest pictures, which shows the entire area overgrown, it was part of Camp Current at that point with the brickyard across the street, but it, it had all been. So I, at any rate, I, I do appreciate that context very much. And I think that this is a, a thoughtful application. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gillette. Uh, this is the chair again. Uh, do we have any other questions from the panel? Mr. Binghorst. So Commissioner Binghorst, for the record, I had a question or I need clarification on your stumps. Uh, you said that you wanted to leave the stumps on the steep hillside uh, along Prospect Avenue in place for erosion control, uh, which is likely a very good idea. Um, but I assume there are other stumps in the more in the flatter areas. And just what are your intentions with those stumps? Um, are those to remain in place as well? This is Kevin Hahn, chair, recognizes Mr. Brody. Brody? Yes, hi. Um, yes, all the stumps in that flat area are intended to be cut flush uh, and filled over with, uh, with planting soil. Um, sometimes they'll shoot off um, sprouts and we'll prune those down. Uh, until the stumps die. Just uh, one additional question, if I may, may Commissioner Binkhorst again. Uh, just for the record, nothing you're doing is going to impair the flood control nature of this area, I presume? No, no, not at all. If, if anything, it will, it will enhance it. Um, for the engineer, the town engineer did recommend removing some additional debris from the east side of the brook, um, which we will do. Uh, and the nature of the plantings are such that they would minimize, you know, the falling of logs and trees and so forth into the into the brook, and the, the stream banks will certainly be stabilized. Um, Thank you. I have nothing. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Bankhorst. Thank you, Mr. Brogy. Uh, do we have any other questions from the panel? Uh, I see no further questions. Uh, does the applicant wish to make uh, any remarks before we turn to public comment? Uh, no, Mr. Uh, Chairman, not at this time. Oh, Mr. Brogy, I apologize. Go ahead. That's fine. I just wanted to say that that in, in my professional opinion, the, the plan doesn't result in, in any adverse impacts to the wetlands or water courses. Um, and, it, and it satisfies the factors for consideration as provided in the Wetlands Act and the West Hartford Wetland Regulations. Okay, with that, Mr. Thank Chairman, that can, oh, I'm sorry. That concludes our presentation. Oh, that's what the, the chair recognizes Mr. Smith. Smith. I apologize, Mr. Chairman. It's difficult with the little lag in time doing this and uh, my apologies, but uh, that concludes, with that, that concludes our presentation. And uh, we'll stand down and wait to hear if there are any comments from the public. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Smith. Again, this is Kevin Hearn, the chair again. Okay, so uh, we are now going to turn over to the public comment uh, portion. This is going to be our our, uh, uh, our second time doing this, so we'll, we'll see how it goes. Uh, so I'll turn this over to, should I be turning this over, Mr. Dubay? Am I turning this over to you? Uh, oh, sorry, Ms. Gillette has a question before we... Oh, we're just going to take a little detour. Ms. Gillette, can recognize this Liz Gillette? I, Liz Gillette, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. I was wondering if there were any plans for 
any planting on the west side of the property abutting the small drainage ditch, that area that you say had been overrun with bittersweet, et cetera, that is now just chips and bare and lovely brand new galvanized fencing? Um, Mr. Brody, you know, yeah, at, at the moment there is not. That is all state of Connecticut owned property, everything west of the fence and including the fence. So at this time, no. Thank you. Uh, does anyone else from the panel have any questions? I'm just going to cycle through you all. Just make sure before we move over to public comment. Okay, we will now turn over to the public comment portion. Mr. Dume, do we have anyone on the phone for this application? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I will defer to the moderator. We do have four call in, at least four call in participants, but while I have the microphone, Mr. Chairman, I would like to note for the record, our uh, public comment email address has been monitored um, and there are no additional comments that have been received since 3.30 p.m. up through this point in time. So with that, I'll turn to the moderator um, and we'll go to any members of the public. Thank you, Mr. Dume and Mr. Chairman. Good evening, everyone. I will now unmute a random phone line. Every person who has called in must state their name when prompted. The person whose name we hear will be the person whose line has been unmuted. That person will then be recognized and allowed to speak. If you do not say your name when your line is unmuted, you will be removed from the call and you may watch on TV or online. I will now begin. Callers, please say your name now. Okay. Moving on, callers, please state your name now. Caller whose phone number starts with A60881, please state your name now. Kathy Kwiatkowski, is that the right one? You're looking for 5512? Yes, thank you, Kathy. It is your turn to comment. Please restate your name and provide your street address. Your comments may start now. Um, Kathy Kripkowski, 100 Goodwood Circle, Hartford, Connecticut. However, I wanted to comment on on um, the three uh, proposals about the parking lot of Elizabeth Park, and not Ms. this particular issue. Okay, then you you must be lobbied. I'm going to place you on hold on a virtual hold, and we will come back to you at the time. Okay. This is not the correct hearing. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Chairman, if you want to announce that if they are calling on behalf of the second applicant. Um... Yeah. So, and, and just to, so I could, uh, this is Kevin Hearn, the chair again. Um, I'm just going to ask you quickly, uh, Urida. Uh, and so to, just to clarify, the um, Anyone that's on the phone right now, they may be on the phone for the next application. And so that's not uh, that's not vetted on the front end. Is that correct? Okay. Correct. All right. So uh, anyone that is on the phone right now, we are taking public comment on the Kane Street application. Uh, we have not yet gotten to the hearing on the uh, Elizabeth Park application for the evening. So again, uh, we're taking a uh, comment right now uh, on the uh, on the Kane Street application. So uh, you're right, if they are, if they have comment for the uh, Elizabeth Park application, should they hang up and call back? What, what, is, the, what is the appropriate uh, action? Yes, Mr. Chairman, that is my recommendation. Okay, so uh, just so just to clarify, this is Kevin Ahern again. Uh, if anyone is calling on the uh, Elizabeth Park application, we have not gotten to that hearing yet. Uh, we will uh, be uh, opening that hearing uh, fairly uh, soon, but we are currently on the uh, on the Kane Street application. So if you're calling on Elizabeth Park, you can hang up now uh, and you can call back when we get to the hearing on Elizabeth Park. Uh, and with that, I'll give everyone a moment to hang up if they are 
if you do not have a comment on the Kane Street application. Uh, and I'll hand it back to the moderator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There appears to be one caller on the line. Caller, you have been unmuted. Please state your name. Please state your name. Mr. Chairman, I think we are all set and we have no callers for this hearing at the moment. Thank you very much, Sharida. Uh, this is Kevin O'Hearn, the chair again. Uh, so at this point, uh, we are nearing the end of this uh, hearing. Uh, I would like to give the applicant one final opportunity before the hearing is closed. Uh, Council, do you have any further comments on this before we close this hearing? No, again, uh, Mr. Chairman, Chris Smith for the record. Again, on behalf of the team, Mr. Evans in particular, and then our entire team, thank you for uh, taking time uh, this evening to go through this application with us and this proposal. And again, thank you to uh, your professional staff and in particular town planner, Mr. Dumay, uh, for uh, assisting us not only in preparing for this meeting, but also in uh, assisting us in preparing uh, this enhancement and restoration plan that's before you this evening. So on behalf of the team, unless anyone from the team has any other comments, thank you very much and, and have a nice night and stay safe. Thank you. This is Kevin Hearn, the chair again. Thank you, Attorney Smith. I appreciate that. Uh, and, and so with that, uh, this hearing is uh, closed. Uh, and just to remind anyone who's listening in, we will be uh, deliberating on this item at the end of all of the public hearings uh, at the end of the night. Um, and so at this point, what we're going to do uh, as we transition from one hearing to the next, uh, we are going to take a short recess uh, and we will return uh, uh, forthwith. Thank you. Uh, guys, this is Kevin. We're in recess right now, so if you need to use the facilities, grab a snack, do whatever you need to. Gordon? Five minutes. Okay? All right. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I'm going
We are ready to go. Good evening again. I am Kevin Hearn, Chair of the Town Plan and Zoning Commission, and I'd like to welcome you to tonight's public hearing of the Commission on applications number 1121, 1122, and 1355, 1563 Asylum Avenue. For the record, I would like to note that the required meeting agenda, application materials, and legal notice are all available on the town website. Because in-person attendance to public meetings is likely to increase the risk of transmission of COVID-19, this hearing is being conducted in accordance with Governor Lamont's Executive Order 7B and 7 -R. With that, will the town planner please read the legal notice? Mr. Chairman, Todd DeMay for the record. Kevin Ahern, Chair. Uh, Mr. Jume, if I, if I could uh, clarify, I believe uh, we've already taken attendance uh, and then we can move yes. straight to the legal notice. That is correct, Mr. Chairman. Just for the record, I would like to know, um, we, on, sitting on this application, we have a quorum of the commission with Commissioners Ahern, Commissioners Gillette, Commissioners Binkhorst, and Commissioner Gomes. And with that, I'll read the legal notice. West Hartford Planning and Zoning Commission legal notice. The Town of West Hartford Planning and Zoning Commission, also acting as the Inland Wetland and Watercourse Agency, will hold a regular meeting at 7 p.m. on Wednesday, May 13th. Public hearings will convene at 7.15 p.m. or soon thereafter, as the matter may be heard on the following. I will read all three legal notices for all three applications, as it is our practice to read those together and hear them concurrently. 1563 Asylum Avenue, Elizabeth Park, application Inland Wetland 1121. On behalf of the City of Hartford, requesting approval of a map amendment to the official Inland Wetlands and Watercourse map of the Town of West Hartford. The proposed amendment is based on an on-site soil survey prepared by a professional soil scientist. Submitted for agency receipt on March 2nd, required public hearing scheduled for April 6th, 2020. Meeting postponed and rescheduled to May 13th. 1563 Asylum Avenue, Elizabeth Park, application Inland Wetland 1122. On behalf of the City of Hartford, requesting approval of an Inland Wetland and Watercourse permit to conduct certain regulated activities, which may have an adverse impact on a wetland regulated area. The applicant is proposing a parking area expansion, including associated site lighting and drainage improvements. The proposed activity takes place within both a wetlands and adjacent 150 foot upland review area. Submitted for agency receipt on March 2nd, determined to be potentially significant and set for public hearing on April 6th. Meeting postponed and rescheduled to May 13th. 1563 Asylum Avenue, Elizabeth Park. Application SUP 1355 of, on behalf of the City of Hartford, requesting approval of a special use permit for the expansion of the existing parking area in association with a visitor center renovation. Improvements include parking, stormwater management, plantings, and site lighting. Submitted for TPC receipt on March 2nd, required public hearing scheduled for April 6th, meeting postponed and rescheduled to May 13th. At these hearings, interested persons may be heard or written communication received as outlined below. The applications related to the items above are available for public review on the Town Planning and Zoning Commission website at www.westharfordct.gov, clicking on Boards and Commissions, TPZ, Current Agenda, or by request via email to comment.tpz at westharfordct.gov, Public hearings will be conducted exclusively as virtual meetings in accordance with the Town Plan and Zoning Commission rules and regulations for the transaction of business and Executive Orders 7B and 7I issued by Governor Ned Lamont. The public hearings will be broadcast live on West Hartford Community Interactive Comcast Channel 5 and Front TV, Frontier TV Channel 1698 and streamed live at www.whctv.org. Any interested persons may be participate in real time by calling 1-408-418-9388 and using the following access code. Access code 793-464-094 at 7.15 p.m. Participants using caller ID blocking will not be permitted to participate. Participants will be called in the order in which their call is received. When prompted by the chair and or moderator, participants will have the permission to speak on matters germane to the hearings. Any interested persons may also submit written communication via email to comment.tpz at westhartfordct.gov. Written comments will be made part of the record at the May 13th public hearing and posted on the town's website. 
In order to be included as part of the record, comments must meet the following requirements. Comments must be received no later than 3.30 p.m. on Monday, May 13th. The subject of the email shall be the application number and address, TPZ May 13th public hearing. The body of the email must begin with interested, the interested person's full name and the street address. Comments must be germane to the application and no longer than 500 words. This notice was posted on the town's website on 429 and continuously maintained. Kevin Ahern, TPC slash IWW Chairman, Todd DeMay, Town Planner slash Inland Wetlands Administrative Officer. Mr. Chairman, I'd also like to note for the record that in compliance with Governor Lamont's Executive Orders 7IE, postings of signs providing notice of these hearings were posted at the Elizabeth Park entrances on Asylum Avenue, Prospect Avenue, and the pedestrian entrance on Wallbridge. In addition, and in compliance with Executive Order 7IF, a mailing of direct abutters was conducted to all direct abutters of the park. This direct abutters mailing included information to access the hearing that was just read as part of the legal notice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Dume. Uh, this is Kevin O'Hearn, the chair again. Uh, and just to confirm uh, that we do have a quorum of the commission. So because of the virtual meeting format, there are some special rules and procedures regarding hearings that I need to cover before we begin. Uh, first, phone access is only intended for members of the public who wish to actively participate and provide comments on the notice application for 1563 Asylum Avenue, Elizabeth Park. If you're interested in speaking on this item, please call 1-408-418-9388 and enter the access code 793-464-094. Again, that's 408-418-9388 and enter access code 793-464-094. If you're on the phone and do not plan to speak, please hang up and watch live on television on West Hartford Community Interactive Comcast Channel 5, Frontier TV Channel 6098, or streaming at whctv.org. Again, if you do not plan to comment, please hang up your phone now and instead listen to the hearing on TV or the internet. Thank you. So for the members of the public who are still on the phone, please do not mute your device. The meeting moderator will keep everyone's line muted until it is your turn to speak. If you mute your own line, the moderator may not hear your voice when she calls for comment. Second, I'd like to describe how the hand raising process will work. Unfortunately, our conference, conference technology does not allow us to identify individual callers by name. So when the public comment portion of the meeting begins, the moderator will randomly unmute one call in line and ask everyone to say their name at the same time. The voice that we hear will belong to the person whose line is unmuted. That person will then be recognized by the moderator and asked to restate their name and provide their street address. We will repeat this process until we have unmuted every phone. It is very important that you say your name each time you are prompted by the moderator. If the moderator unmutes a phone line and does not hear a voice after the prompt, that phone line will be removed from the conference. If you have called in and are also streaming the meeting on YouTube or watching on TV, please silence your other device when you speak. Otherwise, there will be an echo because there's a slight delay in the television and streaming broadcast. Third, I ask that all speakers keep their comments brief and germane to the application. Obscene, offensive, or threatening language will not be tolerated. Anyone who violates this rule will receive a warning. And if the conduct continues, I will ask the moderator to mute the person's phone line the remainder of the meeting. If the violation is egregious, that person will be muted immediately. Fourth, the public was provided the opportunity to submit written comments on the application via mail and email. These comments have been published at the town's website as a PDF and are embedded in the online agenda. For the record, I will read the names of all of those who have submitted written comments. Mr. Dume, are there any written comments to read? Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes, we have two sets of written comments that were submitted as part of the record, um, both posted on the town's website. Uh, Dennis Barone, a comments expressing his opposition to the application 
and a Horton Barnaby um, comment supporting the application. There have been no other comments submitted up to this point other than those two. Thank you, Mr. DeMay. Again, this is Kevin O'Hearn, the chair. Members of the public are welcome to continue sending comments to comment.tbz at westhartfordct.gov, and those comments will be distributed to the members of the commission and also read into the record. Finally, I'd like to outline uh, for all of the attendees these rules of engagement and how the commission operates the, this public hearing. For those, first, those presenting or commenting should state their name and address for the record. Please spell your name. The commissioners may ask questions during the testimony of the applicant. All questions and comments will be directed through the chair and only after recognition by the chair, including follow-ups. If feasible, the chair will have the members hold their questions until the end of the applicant's presentation or until the end of a logical break in the applicant's presentation. Following the testimony of the application, the public will then have their chance to comment about the current application in the manner previously described. Upon conclusion of the public's comments, the applicant will have the opportunity to discuss the opinions expressed. Upon conclusion of the applicant's rebuttal, and if there are no further questions from the commissioners, the public hearing will be closed. The practice of the commission to render a decision on an application the same night following all items on the public meeting agenda. So I'd like to conclude by thanking everyone in advance for your patience. This is uh, only our third virtual public hearing uh, and we're still learning from the experience. So there's bound to be some bumps and glitches along the way, but we remain committed to the principles of open and transparent government. So with that, will the applicant please proceed with their presentation? Um, Todd, are you going to put up the presentation? For the record, Todd DeMay, Tom Planner, yes, I will do that if prompted uh, by the applicant. It sounds like they're requesting that. I will pull that up right now. One moment. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. I, I would like to remind the applicants that they must state their names before speaking. And, uh, and this is uh, Kevin Arnold, the chairman, again, it, 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 it is going to seem a bit robotic and repetitive and, uh, and not the normal way of speaking, but for the purposes of this, uh, this forum, we do need to, every time we're moving from one person to the next, you need to state your name again. So with that, please proceed. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Mary D. Hayes, D-E-H-A-I-S, site planner with Two Design LLC located in New Britain. With me is Chuck Corsi of Corsi and Company, the project's neighborhood outreach consultant, Bill Barlow, principal of Two Design, James McManus, soil scientist of JMM Wetland Consulting Services, Brian Cunningham, civil engineer of Robert Green Associates, and Christine Doty, president and CEO of the Elizabeth Park Conservancy, who's on hand for any questions. We will be presenting the proposed Elizabeth Park Visitor Center parking lot and maintenance yard on behalf of the City of Hartford and the Elizabeth Park Conservancy. We are seeking special use permit and inland wetlands approval tonight. Next slide, please. We will be, um, I'm sorry, the meeting agenda is pretty straightforward. Uh, we've tried to keep it short, but we will be available uh, for any questions you may have. We will now begin our presentation with public outreach. Next. This is, this is Kevin O'Hearn, the chair again. Uh, Mr. Corsi, I believe this is being turned over to you. If you could unmute your mic and make your announcement again. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. My name is Chuck Corsi, C-O-U-R-S-E-Y, and I reside at 21 Walbridge Road in West Hartford. I'm a principal at Corsi and Company and was retained by the Elizabeth Park Conservancy to conduct neighborhood outreach for this project. The goal is, of outreach is to identify concerns that stakeholders, including neighbors, may have. I will share those concerns for you in this presentation, and after I'm done, our professionals will address how those concerns are being addressed. I could have the next slide, please, Todd.
Outreach was conducted with those residents directly adjacent to the parking and maintenance area of the north end of Wallbridge. The parking uh, and maintenance area are shown in the upper center of the photo. You can see the Rose Garden uh, to the far right. We held two physically distant meetings on May 2nd and May 6th, and you can read a more detailed summary of my outreach in my report uh, that you each should have. Uh, next slide, please, Tom. These are the concerns that were identified. Uh, the first on the list, lighting. Neighbors were concerned about the height of the lampposts. They do not want lighting spilling off the property onto their own properties. They do not want lights on constantly or during the middle of the night. Now let's go to the next uh, slides to take a look in further detail some other concerns. Next slide, please, Todd. These, folk, uh, these photos were taken late last summer, and as you can see, show a rather messy and disorganized parking lot and maintenance area. The neighbors and I walked this area on May 2nd. Neighbors agreed that the lot and maintenance area uh, were in definite need of an upgrade and cleanup. Uh, next slide, please, Todd. Uh, this gate and curb cut are at the end of Wallbridge, directly southeast of the new park entrance at the end of Wallbridge. Neighbors uh, 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 would like the gate, the curb cut, and any vehicle access here from Wallbridge or anywhere from Wallbridge to be removed. Uh, next slide, please, uh, Todd. The primary concern of neighbors is water flow from the park onto Wallbridge. This, uh, this photo taken in February shows one of the sources of water flow onto Wallbridge at the new Wallbridge entrance looking south. Again, the solution to this problem will be addressed by our professionals later on in the presentation. Uh, next slide, please, Todd. The photo on the left here was taken in June of 2019. The one on the right was taken last week. Uh, I thought I didn't do as good a job with the drawing as you did, but you can see where that circle is in the far right. That's where the existing drain is. Uh, and in the, the photo from 2019 where uh, uh, it's backed up, uh, you cannot see the drain. Since last summer, drains and pipes on the park property have been cleared and cleaned, resulting in better flow and less flooding on the property. Next slide, slide please, Todd. Thank you. These two photos were taken last week. We're looking at the trail that leads to the park from Wallbridge directly across from Birch Road. Again, I uh, can't reiterate enough, the neighbors are particularly concerned about runoff from the park onto Wallbridge. They certainly don't want to see runoff increased and would like to see it decreased. Specifically, they are concerned about what may happen when the proposed water quality basin overflows into the wetlands to the south of the parking maintenance area adjacent to Wallbridge. Again, we'll get the, the professionals, we'll get into the solutions for that. Uh, but it also should be noted that if closing this path would decrease water runoff to Wallbridge, neighbors we spoke with had no objection to closing that path. Next slide, please, uh, Todd. Uh, many of the neighbors' concerns are directed at the NDC, specifically inadequate sewer capacity to prevent flooding from heavy storms and uh, the current topography of Wallbridge Road in this area. This photo shows how Wallbridge is shaped like a bowl with one of the higher elevations in the distance towards Fern Street and the other high point behind us in this photo uh, near the new Wallbridge entrance uh, that we've already shown. The low point in this bowl is across the street from that tan Honda, that uh, uh, the only car in the street there, uh, and that's near uh, 131 Wallbridge. And that's the first place where during flooding events, the water begins to uh, gather uh, and noting that there is also a storm uh, sewer right there. Next uh, slide, please, Todd. Uh, these photos show what can happen during the worst storm events due to the MDC's inadequate sewer capacity. The photo from the left is from April 2018, and I want to thank uh, the neighbors, one of the neighbors, for uh, letting me use this photo. And the one on the right was taken on Monday. It's my understanding that the MDC is working on uh, future mitigations, uh, mitigation plans for this. 
Uh, that concludes my portion of the presentation, uh, but of course I will stand by and ready to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you, Mr. Corsi. This is Kevin Ahern. Uh, who's up again? Who's up next for the applicant? Uh, Phil Barlow, B A R L O W. Good evening. I'm Phil Barlow, founding principal of Two Design. Uh, Two Design is a 33 year old firm, and for 21 of those years, we have been working on projects uh, within Elizabeth Park. Uh, in 1999, we designed the pedestrian walkway system. Uh, we followed that in around 2005 with the design of the parking lot adjacent to the greenhouses and new visitor center. Uh, 2010, we were fortunate to redesign the summer house at the Rose Garden. Uh, and most recently, we have designed and implemented the pedestrian entrances at the park uh, and the new stage. Uh, so all these projects came uh, with similar challenges. So what we have with this project, um, certainly we didn't solve uh, the ongoing problems, drainage problems with the park, but I think it's fair to say that we didn't, uh, none of these projects exasperated uh, the problems uh, either. Uh, so hopefully this brief outline gives the commission and neighbors an understanding that we do uh, understand the issues of the park and we are quite familiar uh, with the challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barlow. This is Kevin Hearn, the chair again. Who's up next for the app? Mary DeHayes, D-E-H-A-I-S from Two Design. Uh, to orient everyone, the site is centrally located in the park, borders on the eastern side of Walbridge Road and west of the Rose Garden. It currently houses the maintenance yard for Elizabeth Park and also accommodates any overflow parking from major events held at the park. The area is currently entirely impervious, which preserves the green space of the park and is one of the few locations within the park that can be developed due to the large wetland areas located on site. This project was developed in accordance with the 2017 master plan as a major priority item for future development. This master plan was formulated based on discussions and collaborations with its stakeholders, interest groups, and community members and neighbors. Next slide, please. Our site plan formalizes the existing parking lot and reconfigures the maintenance yard. The major site improvements include gated entry to the maintenance yard surrounded by a six foot high solid vinyl fence. Additional plantings will be added for screening the, um, the bay that's closest to Walridge Road. The fence and concrete apron that Chuck mentioned earlier will be removed and a granite curb will be installed to close off that entrance and exit point. Renovated parking will consist of 70 total spaces, three accessible and 10 for compact cars. There will be an accessible route to the park. New shade trees will be planted. Improved drainage infrastructure and natural methods will be used to control stormwater runoff, which Brian will discuss in further detail. At the neighbor's request, we have also added permeable pavers in the southernmost parking spaces, which is noted in the darker shade of gray. This is an addition and will need to be submitted as a formal change to the town. I'd like to direct your attention to the red line uh, at the southern end of the parking lot. This line denotes the current line of impervious. As you can see, the maintenance yard and the parking area will occupy approximately the same amount of space as it currently does. And note that the existing impervious extends farther south than our proposed design. Another significant benefit is that the proposed design will be entirely located behind the existing berm along Walbridge Road as it is today. This berm is heavily planted with mature evergreen trees for screening. Next slide, please. New site lighting is proposed. The photometric plan shows the locations in red. 
We've taken measures to ensure there's no trespass over the property line and the two lights closest to Walbridge Road will contain house shields to further reduce any light exposure. The light fixture and the pole selected match existing lighting already in the park and the height is set at 14 feet. These lights will be controlled on a timer set to go on at dusk and off at approximately 10 p.m. Next slide, please. This is Kevin Hearn, the chair again. Um, are we moving on to another uh, individual in the presentation? Uh, why am I having so much feedback? Is that better? Mr. Dumay? Excuse me, he needs to hang up one of his lines. Hang up one of my lines. Um, Mr. McNannis, I'm noting here that you are logged in in two different locations. You must have two devices in the room that are logged in and the feedback is causing uh, that noise. Yes. Very good. Thank you. Uh, for the record, uh, James McManus, certified professional soil scientist with JMM Wetland Consulting Services, with offices in Newtown. Scott, if you could put the, the uh, slide 17 back. Thank you. Back on uh, March 18th of 2018, I went out and delineated <clears throat> the wetlands within the study area. Um, and I found three separate areas. The first one was called, I called my numbered series, and that's located in the southwestern portion, which is kind of essentially where it says water quality basin. The second one was an A series, which is located to the east of that. Uh, it's an isolated pocket. And then the third one was my, my B series, which is north of the visiting center in the existing maintenance building. Um, essentially, the all the wetlands were disturbed and all the soils within the wetlands were disturbed within our study area. Uh, the, the numbered series wetland, again, is where the is south of the water quality basin is uh, wooded swamp. <clears throat> and uh, A is the same thing. And then B is a maintained lawn, wet lawn with scattered trees. We did look at the functionality of all these three wetlands. And um, essentially there's really only one principal function on each. Well, the main one being wetland B, which is uh, the north again of the maintenance and visiting center. And that is called uh, basically a value of recreation. Uh, this has been a long-standing open space area or park, as everybody knows. Um, other than that, the uh, the wetlands offer low to very low functionality. But like I said, with, with the exception of the value of recreation. Um, at the re at, uh, if you have the report in front of you, my report, uh, you can follow along with some of the pictures I, I put in there. And there's six three sets of photos with two on each, so a total of six photos. You want to take a, a, a bird's eye look of what I looked at back in, in 2018. Um, at the writing of this report, however, we didn't have any direct impacts, but as the project team went through um, with the uh, talks with the neighbors and such, we do have an impact that's not outlined in my report since it was kind of a, uh, last minute addition, and that is in that northwest corner, if you will, next to the maintenance building, where it shows the earthen berm that's proposed, and that is that is within the my B series, which again is a maintained lawn that, and disturbed. Uh, we also looked at direct impacts to wetlands, which typically 
uh, associated with short term during construction and then long term, which essentially deals with habitat and water quality, for example. Um, we didn't anticipate any any impacts on a on a uh, in an indirect fashion as well. Um, ENS, we have a robust erosion and sediment control plan, and also the slopes within the proposed uh, development area or the proposed project are gentle to relatively gentle, which reduces uh, the risk of significant erosion. Uh, another item we look at when we look at indirect impacts is uh, removal of vegetation or habitat. And, and uh, the majority of the area has either minimum amount of woody vegetation or no woody vegetation at all. So we're not anticipating any uh, impacts due to any vegetative removal. Another item we look at is uh, is impacts due to uh, from a wetland hydrology or stream flow. Uh, we are not proposing or we do not anticipate uh, changes to the hydrologic regime. Uh, the, the proposed additions of parking and various other things will not adversely change the hydro uh, geology of the regime of all these wetlands, including the even the uh, proposed impact in that northwest corner. Another item we look at is uh, finally is uh, any impacts to water quality. And in fact, they were actually going to improve it as, uh, to the existing conditions, which is really doesn't have much of uh, any uh, control of runoff, as you can see from the road problems and also that uh, catch basin or that yard drain, if you will, was uh, not draining properly. We actually, and that would be go through in a minute, a, a formal drainage, uh, uh, proposed drainage uh, design, which will, in our opinion, will increase the functionality of the way how water moves off and not have an impact to the regulated resources on or off the site. Um, there was a, a fair amount of uh, discussion and alternatives and what should we do and how should we do things. And, uh, and in fact, uh, I think the proposal as proposed is, uh, an improvement to what is there now, particularly with water quality of the wet, uh, water quality to the wetlands, particularly the numbered series wetland which will have a water quality basin associated with it and a formal drainage uh, system installed. Um, and with the berm that will hopefully, uh, and the, the engineer will get involved with that, control the flooding of the street in the neighborhood so the neighbors will uh, be satisfied. So uh, the, the, the current uh, proposal and current alternative is the best one uh, to achieve all the all the uh, requirements the folks want. We we want better water quality and, and protection of wetlands and stopping of flooding. And the current proposal does all three of those things. And that's it for me right now. But I'm certainly available for questions. This is Kevin Hearn, the chair again. Uh, let's actually a uh, quick a uh, quick comment from uh, the town planner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Todd DeMay, Tom Planner. Um, everyone can see the slide that's being shared right now. That was the one that Mr. McManus uh, just explained. If you can see the um, really well-crafted circle and arrow highlighted in red, um, that's the area, Mr. McManus or Mr. Hayes, if you can just, for the record, note, um, this area is not in the commission, the agency's application materials. This new berm is a late addition that is completely responsive to neighborhood concerns. Is that correct? Uh, turning back to you, Mr. McManus, if you could just un uh, unmute your microphone, please. Yes, that is correct. Thank you, Mr. Jumay. Follow up. Uh, one just follow up for the record, Mr. Uh, Chairman Todd Jumay. Um, this change was reviewed by our engineering division um, late this afternoon. So staff did have the opportunity to review this 
specifically for its stormwater impacts. So I just want to state that for the record. So that area we're talking about uh, to try to retain more water on site uh, before it leaving uh, down Wallbridge was reviewed from a stormwater quality standpoint. Um, as part of your application materials, late this afternoon, uh, an email was sent out to the commission that identified um, this um, area, but it also identified the engineering division's final comments stating they had no technical concerns with the application or stormwater report. That information was also posted on, on to our website, uh, but, but not this specific change to plans. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Dumay. Again, this is Chairman Kevin Hearn. Uh, who's next in the applicant's presentation? That would be Brian Cunningham, C-U-N-N-I-N-G-H-A-M. I'm a professional engineer. I work for Robert Green Associates, Six Old Waterbury Road in Terryville, Connecticut. You can go to the next slide, please. So we've heard from the community meetings, there are concerns about uh, drainage, water quality, pre and post flows, and a desire to look at some additional uh, grading studies. So we'll talk a little bit about those in a, in a minute. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. So the maintenance yard, which is located in the upper left of center, of the map in front of us here. The maintenance yard consists of a relatively flat area on an impervious surface with concrete block material, storage bins, and other lay down areas. The maintenance operations area for the park is being condensed to a smaller footprint closer to the garage. That's the existing L-shaped building up there. The only catch basin in the yard is being replaced with a new structure It'll have a, a hood over its outlet pipe to capture floatable materials within that catch basin while the stormwater drains out in a new outlet pipe that will discharge into an existing storm manhole at the Wallbridge Birch Road intersection. The rest of the area is being repurposed as a paved striped parking lot to maximize use of this space. The proposed improvements result in a slight reduction to the overall site imperviousness, as was noted by Mrs. DeHayes. Storm runoff from the parking area will sheet flow off the pavement to the water quality basin, which is located on an adjoining sheet. If you could skip down two slides, please. So there's a, a solid line going diagonally across the top of the screen. That's a match mark. So right off the end of the parking lot is where this water quality basin is proposed. Before flowing into the water quality basin, the runoff is gonna traverse that 18 foot long section of permeable pavement that was shown. That's the last row of parking before the water gets into the water quality basin. And a 10 foot long grass area, which is up gradient of the water quality basin itself. Um, the bottom of the water quality basin will be a, uh, about an, a foot and a half excavation going on here to create this bowl. This will be an 18 inch uh, bioretention soil media mix, which will be spread and will be planted with a water tolerant and wildlife type grasses. The water quality basin is sized to contain the first inch of storm runoff. The remainder of the storm will be discharged over a weir to flow overland to the gutter line of Wallbridge Road as it does today. During early coordination meetings, the town has suggested we consider building an earthen berm in the area of the new park entrance to address storm flow from the park getting to Wallbridge Road. If you can go backward one slide. Thank you. The proposed earth berm extends in a, a semicircular, about a quarter circle from the back of the maintenance building to run parallel to the pathway leading into the park. And then there's a lower area associated with that uh, looks like an egg to the north. Um, what that does 
is that berm is going to capture the storm flow that comes down a, a narrow section of the park from almost as far up as Asylum Avenue. Um, blows down this way and today it, it appears to flow down Wallbridge Road contributing to that flooding issue that is ongoing. So this berm will intercept that flow, forcing it back into a park storm drainage system. That storm drainage system outlets into the pond next to the pond house building. The hydrology model that was created uh, it takes into account all the flows from the site and, and then the changes. That model is indicating a reduction of 20 to 30 percent of the peak runoff rates to the low point at Wallbridge Road, that area that uh, Mr. Corsi showed and a lot of uh, water ponded up in it in an event back in February of 2018. The natural flow path for stormwater from this portion of the park is to Wallbridge Road at the intersection of Birch Road. A small earthen berm is proposed there also. If you could skip down one slide. There's a, a pipe, you can see a pipe crossing, the parallel lines, that's where the outlet for the maintenance yard drainage, it ties into a manhole uh, at the Birch Road intersection. A little bit south of that, there's a, a curved double line. That's a berm that's being created. And what that does is that will direct the flow from the water quality basin to flow to the gutter of Wallbridge without that water crossing the wood chip path that runs from Birch Road into the park. And the idea behind that is to, to try to dry that little bit of pathway out a little bit by concentrating the water in an area that isn't traversed by pedestrians. <clears throat> As a result of the um, community meetings organized by, by Mr. Corsi, two additional grading studies were evaluated. And if you could flip to the next slide, please. The attendees had indicated that access to the park opposite Birch Road was redundant to other park access points. This being the case, grading study number one shows a berm constructed on the same land that the current path exists. This berm creates a small water impoundment in a wetland that would further delay the peak runoff from reaching Wallbridge Road. This alternative would increase the depth of water in that wetland by about six inches. We go one more slide. <clears throat> grading study number two, maintaining the grading for that wetland I just mentioned, um, associated with grading study number one, but it added another berm along Wallbridge Street Line. This was another request that came out of the uh, meeting. It came after after the meeting, some follow up conversations uh, with Mr. Corsi, and you can see a. Uh, there's a berm shown extending to the south from that um, in a pipe running south to a, there's a dashed diagonal line. That's a 125 foot contour line. So what that does is it creates another impoundment area that's also a wetland. And this alternative would would add about two inches of depth to water impounded in that particular area in that wetland. So this alternative would, and this alternative would maintain the same six inches of extra water in the wetland just to the north of this, on the other side of the old path. So in looking at these studies, as well as our original proposal, um, it's my opinion 
that the proposed option is preferred over the grading studies for two reasons. One, we have demonstrated that the project as proposed will reduce peak storm flow to Wallbridge Road. And two, putting additional stormwater into one or both of the adjoining wetlands is less environmentally friendly than the proposed alternative that directly affects neither of these small wetland areas. Thank you. Thank you, this is Kevin Ahern, the chair again. Uh, who's up next for the applicant? Mary DeHayes, site planner for Two Design. So we received comments from the town planning and engineering departments, which we have addressed in the resubmissions of our site plan documents. No other department comments were received. Overall, the design will be a substantial improvement uh, to Elizabeth Park. The drainage calculations submitted to the town show a net reduction in overflow to Walbridge Road. These calculations have been carefully reviewed by the town of West Hartford engineers who agree with our assessment. The design meets the intent of the 2017 master plan poses no significant environmental issues. This concludes our presentation and we are now available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Uh, so I will turn it over to questions from the commission. Uh, I see Commissioner Gillette uh, with your hand raised. Please, Commissioner Gillette. I, I have a lot of observational issues. One, the impervious area around the maintenance building now that you propose to repave, for all intents and purposes, it may be packed clay, but there's no asphalt there. And the drain pipe may be clogged, but there's no asphalt there because there is a huge pile of asphalt right at the southern end of that parking area that appears to have been there for quite some time, leaching into that lower area that you're calling a detention basin, which along with the northern edge of, of the parking lot or the western edge towards Walbridge Road are now knee deep in skunk cabbage. They are wetlands. They are wetlands, but they don't appear on your wetlands map. It's very carefully right at the edge. And, and that's a real problem. That's a real problem. So that area, while it may not be percolating well, is not paved area currently. And that's just not true. And the idea that, well, the water is coming from from Elizabeth Park onto Wallbridge. The fundamental problem with Wallbridge is due to the MDC and their sewer lines, and I understand that. But that doesn't mean that you get to funnel all of your runoff into their storm drain and compound the problem. I, I don't understand why you have taken such a totally narrow view of this. You're a park a conservancy, and I'm glad you added the impervious paving at the southern end, which was ignored by your engineer in his presentation. There should be more of it. I, I don't see any progressive thinking. I don't see any environmental. The idea is to get it into a drain as quickly as possible, as opposed to percolating through. I, I'm, I'm very disappointed. Very disappointed in this. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. That's that's all I have to say. Thank you, Ms. Gillette. This is Kevin O'Hearn, the chair again. Um, who on the applicant's team wants to take that one? Somebody's got to take it. <laughs> um, I can. This is this is Mary DeHaze. Um, just so everyone knows, impervious means that water does not get through that area. It doesn't mean that it's paved. It just means that water cannot get through it as if it was infiltrated into natural um, land. And, you know, it's, and there is actually asphalt there. Um, you may not be able to see it because of the concrete 
uh, block walls and all the debris that's you know in there. But there is there is asphalt there. Um, Brian, do you want to talk a little bit about the the drainage? I'm just to, to, to just going to address Ms. Uh, Mr. July real quick. We'll just, let's let them get through their answer, and then you can follow up with your questions. Thank you. Okay. So when I do the assessment of the of how the the water on site moves, I look at what's going on today. And then I look at what our proposed improvements are. And I look at what runoff characteristics are of the in the future. Okay. Now the the model uh, allows me to uh, see the flows before and after. And when I did those flows, we were we were running pretty good as far as even pre and post. So there would probably be no change. However, the addition of intercepting the flow coming from the north by that berm behind the maintenance garage took away a lot of flow that was headed to Wall that heads to Wallbridge Road today. So the assessment, and it's noted in the report, shows there's a there's a, like a 20 to 30 percent decrease in the amount of flow going to the low point on Wallbridge Road. That's the study point for the before and the after flows. So I I have to respectively disagree with Ms. Gillette on her assessment because I'm looking at the, the the modeling numbers and and the changes to the, the ground cover and how the water's handled um, this is all this water quality basin does not be is designed to trap the first inch that's traditionally the the dirtiest of the, the water that flows off a paved surface um, it provides a way to uh, renovate that flow before it goes further uh, toward Wallbridge. Uh, the permeable pavers provide a means to for the for the, the runoff to start to percolate before it gets into the water quality basin. The grass in the basin itself further traps more contaminants. So it's working to renovate the quality of that runoff. So I would suggest that the project would not not will not increase the amount of flooding that you're experiencing downstream until such time as MDC or whomever uh, comes out and and does some renovation work to their existing storm sewer but I'm confident that what we're proposing shows that that we will be putting less water into Wallbridge Road than it goes there today. Yes, uh, Mary. Jim McManus, would you talk about the wetland delineation and how you you establish those lines? Sure, uh, Jim McManus again, uh, wetland scientist, soil scientist. <clears throat> um, as you, as everybody knows, uh, wetlands are determined by soil types here in Connecticut, and uh, we have poorly drained or very poorly drained, and that's, and again, this is a very disturbed site. The entire study area was disturbed, both wetlands and uplands. And um, the boundaries, I spent a lot of time out there digging, digging holes the best I could through the fill and to get the line that was established. Now, because you might see skunk cabbage, which is not an indicator in this state of a wetland, it's a wetland plant, but it is all based on soils. And when you have disturbed compacted soils, you may have some vegetation that wants to sprout because you have an opportunity you have seed source and standing water that hangs around long and it probably should. 
under normal condition. Those aren't wetlands. They may look like wetlands, but they don't meet the definition of the wetland in the state of Connecticut. And that's why I didn't flag some of the areas you might consider to look wet, because they're not by the regulations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, again, this is Kevin Hearn, the chair. Uh, Ms. Gillette, follow-up questions? This is Liz Gillette. As far as I understand from the flagging, the area next beyond to the west of the berm, the existing berm, to Walbridge Road, to the sidewalk, to the road, was not part of your study area. That's the area I'm talking about. I'm looking at your study area with the line around it, and the areas I am talking about are just beyond those red lines. And frankly, if you're stopping water now with a berm behind the maintenance shed from the, the, main, the main area towards Asylum Avenue, that's nice. But it doesn't deal with the runoff directly from the parking lot. And I'm sure that parking lot does not percolate water at all. But can you explain the pile of asphalt at the end of that parking lot? This is not leaving it the same as you saw it when you came. Maybe the legal standard. And that may be what I have to vote yes on. But it really is not the stance I would think a park would take in making a, making an improvement like this. So if you could tell me if you actually took tests next to Walbridge Road and just beyond the parking area and the asphalt dump. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ms. Gillette. Again, this is Kevin Ahern, the chair. Who's going to take that? I'll take it, Jim McManus. Um, I don't exactly know. Ex I, I understand where you are adjacent to the road. I, I don't remember. It's been a few years um, where the asphalt pile is. Uh, I don't think. Uh, I don't think the proposed um, um, well. I did look at uh, the bridge, uh, the Wallbridge Road. Um, I don't remember everything I looked at, but I'm not going to flag a tiny little thing that adjacent to the road that gathers runoff. That to me is not a wetland. That's not a wetland. I'm sorry. I'm not flagging some little ditch adjacent to the road. I'm flagging real wetlands, which I did. Adjacent ditch adjacent to the road is way over the top with flagging. Some ditch that gathers water, that's too much water because there's too much runoff coming into the from the site to the road is not a wetland in my opinion it's more of an engineering concern and a water in a water concern and as the neighbors expressed they are concerned and we're trying to alleviate that concern so uh i don't know about the pile of asphalt i can't believe that will stay there and uh i, I don't know i don't remember i don't remember a pile of asphalt i just remember a lot of disturbance and a lot of just not very kept well kept maintenance yard is what I remember. Thank you. Uh, yes, this is uh, Kevin Hearn, the chair again. Uh, Mary, please go ahead. Yes, uh, we believe that the, the, the city occupies the maintenance yard and is the one that's, you know, moving stuff in and out. And we believe that the city is the one who put the asphalt there, but rest assured, all of the debris in there is going to be removed. Um, and so it will be substantially cleaned up. It'll be substantially more aesthetically looking. Um, it won't look like a dump yard. Uh, this is Kevin Hearn, the chair again. Follow up question for Ms. Gillette. I just have to say, if you are looking at the wetlands to the extent of your property, which is what that area is to Wallbridge Road, and you want to turn around now and say, oh, well, I, I don't know about the asphalt. 
huge dump of asphalt, but uh, that's the city's problem and we're gonna clean it up. I, I'm just really disappointed. This is a chance to do something really positive and good. It's a way of doing something to show people that you can do parking in a responsible wetlands area in a responsible way. Again, I have every sense that I may have to vote yes on this because you are not making it worse. It's just very, very disappointing. I'll leave it to the neighbors to comment. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, you, can I make a comment, please? This is Jim McMahon. Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, the chair recognizes Jim McManus. Thank you. Uh, Todd, can you circle where we're talking about where the asphalt pile is on the drawing you have up now, if that's possible? It's where the pervious parking is. Well, it's outside of my wetland boundary. If it's where the pervious pipe is, it's not even close to my wetlands boundary. Sorry, it isn't. I'd be more than happy to go out there with you and check it out in the site. It's just not, it's just not wet there. The boundaries so that I on the plan are the ones that I flag. All right, so this is Kevin Hearn, the chair. Make no mistake, there's been filled wetlands on the site over the decades of disturbance that's happened out here. Thank you, Mr. McManus. This is Kevin Hearn again. Um, so to the extent that we've established that the wetland scientist is indicating that this is outside uh, of his uh, flagged area, um, I don't know how much more we want to explore this, but I will certainly entertain a follow-up from Ms. Gillette if it is going to move this line of questioning along. All right. Uh, Mr. Hay, did you have uh, any further comment? I was just going to say that um, the the pile of asphalt is kind of in the left-hand corner. It doesn't occupy the entire that entire space, but you know, again, it's going to be removed. So that's all. That's all I have. All right. And you know, Thank we, you, we are developing. Um, you know, our plan was developed in a very responsible way, and. Um, you know, that's that's what we we try to do each time that we design. All right. Thank you, Mr. Hay. Uh, I saw Mr. Bighorst. You had a question. Uh, Commissioner Bighorst, for the record, I had some questions um, both. Uh, well, I'll start with the to the north of the maintenance building. Uh, there is a yard drain uh, there. Could you describe its function and how that's going to interact with the current uh, small basin that you're building there? And I'll just add one other part to that question. Uh, the berm, the, the newly created berm that's going to prevent water from going to Wallbridge uh, will also, um, could it possibly pond water up against the maintenance building during flood events? And uh, what are the impacts there? This is Kevin Hearn, the chair, who'd like to take those questions. I can answer those. Brian Cunningham. Thank you, Mr. Cunningham. Please proceed. <clears throat> There's a, a number of years ago, I think it was in the mid 90s. There's a large drainage project on the park. And, and you don't have the mapping that I've got, but there's a 30 inch concrete pipe that runs behind the maintenance garage and it heads to the north and it ends up outletting into the pond next to the uh, pond house. And there's a number of these yard drains in that area. So as the water builds in that area, it's going to flow. It'll be pushing water into these other yard drains and it'll be drained out through that pipe and on into the, the pond. So the, we don't anticipate flooding any water setting up against the edge of the building because of the way the berm is shaped and the low point forces the water away from the building so that it can get into those, those uh, yard drains that are out in the, that lawn area uh, behind the maintenance garage. 
Uh, Commissioner Minkhorst again, uh, how, how functional is the yard drain? Uh, I mean, I understand that a lot of the water traverses that area onto Wallbridge. It can't be working very effectively. There's yard drains are, are they function when they're kept clean. Uh, there were some issues a couple of years back where they were clogged with um, leaves, grasses and all that. The, um, our understanding is that the park maintenance folks are have, were made aware of that and have since cleaned and have on their to do list uh, a means to go and check those yard drains out periodically to remove accumulated debris that would prevent water from entering that system. Would you uh, equally, um, Mr. Bankhorst, again, accept that as a condition of approval to renovate that yard drain and ensure that it's functioning properly? I, I wouldn't object to that, and I don't think the park would want would object to that. They don't want to create a, a pond behind their maintenance garage, so they're going to, it's to their best interest. So I think that would be acceptable. Uh, this is Kevin Ahern. Uh, I just want to make sure that to the extent that uh, uh, Mr. Hay, if you're leading this presentation, um, uh, to the extent that a condition has been offered and uh, potentially accepted, could you please just confirm that for us? Yes, this is Mary DeHayes. Yes, we can look into that for sure. Okay. And then as a follow-up, Commissioner Binkhorst, again, uh, did anybody consider putting some of this uh, parking lot runoff to that yard drain? Is the discharge point of a pond something that is lower and would prevent additional flooding of Walbridge Road if it were directed in that direction uh, instead of to the south? This is Brian Cunningham again. Uh, the topography doesn't allow us to, to do that. Um, the property slopes from the garage bays down toward the uh, where the water quality basin is, where all the storm water is going. So by gravity, the storm flow can't get into that system. It's too high. Uh, Commissioner Binkhorst, again, I just had some additional questions with regard to the uh, water quality basin to the south now. Um, did you give any consideration to making that perhaps deeper? Uh, according to your calculations, it will hold the first inch um, of a flood event. Uh, was there any consideration of making it larger or deeper to contain more water? No, there are physical constraints kept us from doing that. There's a, there's a groundwater elevation that we're concerned with. So that's why the basin as proposed is, is a mere 18 inches deep at the deepest. Um, also, uh, there are physical constraints, the wetlands that we're trying to avoid. Um, we use, we maximize the use of the space we had available to us. And there's, we're hemmed in by the, you know, the, the landscape berm along Wallbridge by Wallbridge itself and, and these other wetlands that uh, Mr. McManus had, had flagged for us. Uh, and then, uh, Mr. Binkhorst, again, as a follow-up um, to that aspect, the water that overflows out of that water quality basin, how does it get to Wallbridge Road? Uh, is it along that uh, wood chip path that is currently there? It is. It's to the north of the wood chip path. And what we're proposing is a is a, like a one foot, foot and a half high berm to keep that water going the way we want it to come out to Wallbridge in the vicinity of a snet pole 2429. Um, that we're, we're um, keeping that pedestrian path as dry as possible without having our, our waters flowing in there. The grading of that berm is such that the, the low point where the water is going to drain stays north of the berm away from the pedestrian path. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Binkhorst. This is Kevin Hearn again. Um, do we have any further questions on this item? Ms. Gomes, please.
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is uh, for the record, Commissioner Andrea Gomes. Um, I believe this question is for you, Mr. Cunningham. I am looking at your project engineering report and I'm just trying to understand. Um, I understand that the surface flows for all of the projected events will be decreasing with this proposal, but it appears that the system flows will be increasing. Can you explain a little bit? I, I, my understanding is that that's exactly what it sounds like. It's what's flowing across the surface versus what's going into the into the system itself. Um, and I'm just concerned about uh, uh, the market increase of over 17% for a two year event, given the problem we already have with flooding on Wallbridge. Can you discuss that for a bit? Um, I'm not sure I understand your question. Um, Could you, re could you repeat your question? Because I don't think I heard it correctly. I I'm not sure you understand what what was prepared in the report. I want to make sure I answer your question correctly. Okay. Well, can you explain to me that I'm trying to understand? I'm looking at your engineering report, and I'm looking at the tables you have for surface flows and system flows. And again, sorry for the record. This is Commissioner Gomes. Okay. Uh, and. and the system flows table that you have on page two of your report indicates an increase in the delta in flow compared from pre and post development condition. Okay. I know you're looking at an earlier report that did not take into account the, the burn. burn and with the drastic reduction in flows. That was something that was submitted um, I believe la end of last week. And that's the report that city staff just looked at and was able to, because they had flagged, you had a, they had a similar concern as you. And by taking into account the flows that are intercepted by that berm, we now show the numbers that I stated that are running like uh, 20 to 30% reduction in, in flows across the storm events. Okay, understood. Uh, uh, and for the record, Commissioner Gomes, I just wanted to note for the record that the uh, hyperlink to the Mr. Chairman updated engineering and hydrology report that's available on the town's website appears to link to the former, the prior version of the engineering report. So my apologies. Thank you for the clarification, Mr. Cunningham. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gomes. Uh, real quick, before we get to any of the further questions, uh, just a quick uh, question for uh, the town planner. Uh, do, is there anything that you would point out to us that we need to see that we're not seeing? Because we do not have that in front of us. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is town planner, Mr. May. I need to just look at the link and then the, the report in question. Uh, and report back in a few moments. Thank you. All right, so um, we'll we'll circle back to that. Uh, do we have any further questions on the application, Mr. Bankhorst? Uh, Commissioner Bankhorst, again for the record. Um, I had one additional question. There's a abandoned manhole note on your plans uh, that is south of your water quality basin, southwest. Uh, what's the nature of that manhole? Is it a stormwater manhole that also leads to Wallbridge Road? And uh, according to the elevation, uh, it looks like the frame. Is it pretty much the overflow to the water quality basin? And why wouldn't you be using that to get water to Wallbridge and into the storm sewer system? Uh, this is Brian Cunningham. Uh, that looking at old record maps for the site. So that is where the discharge from the original yard uh, maintenance yard catch basin went to that manhole. And then from there, our surveyors couldn't tell where the where the outlet pipe went. And, and I understand it got cleaned out last fall. So maybe now it's visible, but when we were out, it, it was not there. Um, we're abandoning it because we're replacing that drainage system with, with a properly sized pipe. Um, and that, it, 
that manhole is not needed. So we were going to abandon that. By abandon it, it doesn't mean we just, you know, walk away when we actually, uh, in engineer speak, uh, the top of the manhole will be taken off. They'll, they'll, they'll break up the manhole itself and just fill it with uh, soil and plug the pipes on either side. So in actuality, we don't know exactly how it functioned or where it led to or whether it could be of some help. Well, it appeared to it appeared to flow toward toward Wallbridge, but our our folks couldn't tell for sure. Well, they weren't certain where the outlet was, so that's why it didn't show up on our mapping. Um, the existing pipe at the yard drain, the, the catch basin in the maintenance yard, was shown on the older plans to be a six inch uh clay pipe um uh, that uh, a pipe that's pipes too small it clog, it's easy to clog and it, it did clog so uh rather than bank on the on the um the condition that six inch pipe that we couldn't verify um we chose the better option was to put in a uh a new pipe system to properly drain the, the maintenance yard. Okay. Mr. Bakehorst, you have a uh, follow up? Yeah, it's just not a very satisfying answer. I mean, that's near the discharge of uh, your water quality base. And I'm not talking about rebuilding the drainage pipe from the yard drain, but it would seem if that was a nice or a viable technique to get the water into the storm sewer system along Wallbridge that that might be instead of right now you're choosing overland flow and trying to keep it off of the footpath. Um, so that's, you know, that's your position. That's fine. But it would seem to me that that would have fared additional consideration, sort of like the yard drain to the north of the maintenance um, uh, building itself. But that's all I have on that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dumay, do you have a comment? Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman, Todd Dumay, Town Planner for the record. Um, uh, my apologies. I believe the updated report um, in under discussion is this report that I have on my screen now. I'm going to put the table I think that uh, Commissioner Gomes and Mr. Cunningham are looking at. Uh, if you could both confirm this was this was the table that was under discussion prior. That's the that's the updated table that okay. reflects. Yeah, th the, this, this uh, came in, uh, this came in late in the day on Monday, and it appears to uh, Commissioner Gomes is right. This this updated report is not uh, reflected on our website. Um, this specific report here, um, but this is the report that was transmitted to the engineering division for their review. I can confirm that. Uh, this is Kevin Hearn, the chair again. So let me just uh, direct back to Commissioner Gomes. Uh, uh, to the extent, do you have any follow-ups then uh, with this in front of you? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is Commissioner Gomes. Uh, no, that's precisely what I was looking at. I was a bit confused based on the presentation and looking at the prior version, which indicated a, a market increase in the system flow uh, from pre and post conditions. Um, so, so this clarifies it. It was a versioning issue. So thank you, Mr. Dumay. Uh, this is Kevin Ahern, the chair again. Uh, okay, so let's uh, let then just head back to uh, Mr. Bighorst. Uh, do you have any follow-up on your, your questions, Mr. Bighorst? Uh, no, I do not. Thank you. Uh, this is Kevin Ahern, the chair again. Okay, so going back to questions. Do we have any hands up? Do you have any questions from the panel? Okay. So then if we don't have any further questions, uh, I'm gonna ask the applicant, uh, do you have any comments uh, before we move over to the public comment uh, portion for this hearing? This is Mary DeHaze again for the record. Um, nope, I think we're good. 
Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, so at this point, we are then going uh, to move on to the public comment uh, portion uh, of this uh, hearing. I am actually going to restate uh, what I stated prior uh, for any of those who have joined uh, this uh, late and did not hear. Uh, so, so very quickly. Uh, so what we're going to do now is we're going to move on to the public comment portion. Uh, so for anyone who is looking to make public comment, I'm just going to comment first that first the phone access is only intended for members of the public who wish to actively participate and provide comments on the notice application for 1563 Asylum Avenue, Elizabeth Park, that's Inland Wetland 1121, Inland Wetland 1122, and SGP 1355. Uh, so if you're interested in speaking on this item, um, and if you haven't already called, you can call 408-418-9388 and enter access code 793-464-094. Again, that's 408-418-9388. 9388 and enter access code 793-764-094. So if you're on the phone and you do not plan to speak, please hang up and watch live on television on West Hartford Community Interactive Comcast Channel 5, Frontier TV Channel 6098, or streaming at whctv.org. Again, if you do not plan to comment, please hang up your phone now and instead listen to the hearing on TV or the internet. So for those wishing to comment, I'd like to restate how the hand raising process will work. The moderator will randomly unmute one call line and ask everyone to say their name at the same time. The voice that we hear will belong to the person whose line is unmuted. That person will then be recognized by the moderator and asked to restate their name and provide their street address. We will repeat this process until we have unmuted every phone line. It is very important that you say your name each time you are prompted by the moderator. If the moderator unmutes a phone line and does not hear a voice after the prompt, that phone line will be removed from the conference. Now, if you have called in and you're also streaming the meeting on YouTube or watching it on TV, please silence your other device when you speak. Otherwise, there will be an echo because there's a slight delay in the television and streaming broadcasts. Third, I'm gonna ask that all speakers keep their comments brief and germane to the application. Obscene, offensive, or threatening language will not be tolerated. Anyone who violates this rule will receive a warning. And if the conduct continues, I will ask the moderator to mute that person's phone line for the remainder of the meeting. If the violation is egregious, that person will be muted immediately. And so with that, will the moderator please begin with the public comments? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good evening to all the callers. I will now unmute a random phone line. Every person who has called in must state their name when prompted. The person whose name we hear will be the person whose line will be unmuted. The person will be recognized and allowed to speak. If I do not say your name when the line is unmuted, you will be, if you do not say your name when the line is unmuted, you will be removed from the call and you may watch on TV or online. Callers, David. please say your name now. David Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. It is your turn to comment. You may restate your name and provide your street address. David Peterson, 212 Warrington Avenue, West Hartford. I am a lifelong resident of West Hartford. Elizabeth Park has always been part of my life. I served on the board of Elizabeth Park Conservancy for many years, starting shortly after the millennial. During that time, I served as president of the then Friends of Elizabeth Park from 2007 to 2011. From that time to the present, the park has had a rebirth of sorts and continues to attract an increasing number of visitors each year. Concert, tours, daily use from neighbors, as well as residents not only from West Hartford and Hartford, but from Greater Hartford, Connecticut, New England, and all over the world, make Elizabeth Park one of the most popular and favorite destinations in Connecticut. 
This popularity has put increased pressure on both parking and on the need for restrooms. I strongly support applications 1121, 1122, and 1355 made on behalf of the City of Hartford. These applications will help relieve congestion in the busiest part of the park, as well as providing extra parking for visitors and park staff. In addition, there will be more handicapped spaces provided in the most centrally located part of the park near many of the famous gardens. Approved paved surfaces lined appropriately will increase public safety and be easier to maintain during the winter months. Impact on the abutting neighbors should be limited by the existence of well-established landscaping and additional plantings and fencing on the west side of the park abutting Wallbridge Road and Birch Roads. In conclusion, I am confident that both the City of Hartford and the Elizabeth Park Conservancy have done their due diligence in researching the feasibility and possible impacts of the improvements included in these, ap these three applications. When approved, they will continue the rebirth and growth of Elizabeth Park, which is the crowning gem of the Hartford Park system. We who live in West Hartford should be both proud and grateful to have a portion of this wonderful open space in our town. Please support the, th the three applications for Elizabeth Park before you tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. This is uh, the chair again. Just very quickly, um, I want to make sure that I, I stated the, uh, the number of the code correctly. Uh, it is currently uh, posted uh, right now. Uh, on any of the uh, channels in which you can view this hearing. But uh, just in case, it's 408-418-9388, and the access code is 793-464-094. Again, that's 793-464-094. Thank you. Please proceed. Thank you. Good evening. I'm now going to continue with the public's portion and I am going to go ahead and unmute another caller. Callers, please state your name. All callers, Kathy. please. Thank you, Hello? Kathy. Yep. Thank you, Kathy. It is your turn to comment. Please restate your name and provide your street address. Sure. It's Kathy Pedro, P-E-D-R-O. The street address is 131 Walbridge Road in West Hartford. You may begin uh, to comment. Can you? Yes. All right. Yes. Uh, I was in receipt of the April 29th letter. I believe we received it on Friday the next day for the application 1121, the application 1122, and 1355. Um, we have lived at this address for almost 19 years. Um, my main concern with the project, um, I do thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of my family. It's a very, very uh, important matter to us since for the 19 years that we've lived here um, during torrential rains, we have had exceeding flooding, you know, up to halfway up our front lawn. Um, with it sometimes taking five to eight hours to recede, where we can't access our home, we can't access the sidewalk, you know, to, to go on the sidewalk to get into our home, and I have to park on Birch Road and walk through a neighbor's yard to get into my home. Um, well, that is not the park's immediate problem and responsibility. It is the responsibility of our town and the MDC. So with, in light of those comments, I have some suggestions, some questions. Um, we appreciate the Park Conservancy reaching out to us um, through Mr. Corsi. Um, I must say I was um, wishing and preferred that it would have been much sooner. Um, I was not contesting the new entrance two years ago. We were thrilled that that was happening, so I was not 
privy to whatever was laid out as far as the park's master plan. So I consider it kind of a late time to be consulting with neighbors after all these plans have been drawn up um, regarding putting water into existing storm drains, which are wholly inefficient and inadequate, um, and increasing surface water in this catch basin. So with that, um, I was happy that they, you know, sought our input. Um, it's very difficult on the TV to look at the engineering plans that were, Mr. Cunningham was referring to. Um, so I would like to see those in person or, or have a, a more delineated plan. We couldn't understand what he was talking about if there was a new berm added, where that was going to be. And frankly, I just feel like this process with the neighborhood is, is really somewhat rushed for our purposes. Um, our homes are at stake. Um, I would have, you know, my entire basement fill up with water. In a, it, it could potentially happen in a three- to four-inch rain event. So while I'm happy that the catch basin can catch an inch of runoff, um, I'm wondering what happens to that surface water. Um, I actually have video, which I will submit to the committee, um, I have not been able to have the time, since it's only been two weeks, to submit a formal letter with the videos of the water streaming down the current handicap ramp that is right at the end of Birch Road, literally streaming down it during a heavy – this was post-rain. This was just groundwater streaming down the ramp onto our street draining the day after an event. So during the event, um, especially a long rain event, we are at serious injury on my property. Um, if pumps fail, you know, things fail, I have backup pumps, you know, all the neighbors do. Um, we do not want, I can speak for myself, additional water being pumped into an already inadequate storm drain system. And then more water coming from the park, which is at a higher level. So what I would like to see um, the town do, I am not opposed to a parking lot there. Um, we had asked questions about keeping it um, a more impervious material, even grass. Um, I understand the limitations with that as far as people walking and, and falling. But um, pavers, some other type of more impervious material, which would probably percolate and absorb a little bit better um, and, in, and allow for longer absorption rather than quick storm drain, quick drain runoff into that catch basin. You know, in a two- or three-inch rain, you know, I just think that's not adequate. Um, so, and I always, I'm happy that the park has cleaned those storm drains on the north side. Uh, they made a lot of effort to put them in to drain into the pond. Um, that is what created a serious problem on our street for an additional eight or nine hours in 2018, where it was like a river flowing from a, a lake, which was not the pond. It was a lake to the north of the maintenance shed. Uh, it flowed, and my pump stayed on another eight or nine hours just to keep the water, you know, out all night long. So, um, and I would also like to see a smaller parking area on that south end with more grasses and percolation and eliminating some of those spaces on the end. And um, I would like the construction to be delayed so that the neighbors feel like we are more vested in the project. Um, I don't think all of our, any of us are really opposed to the parking lot. We want to have better foot traffic in there and better parking because of the congestion on our streets. But as far as I'm concerned, it's just been way too quickly where we don't have time to consult the MDC. We don't have time to sit and talk to the engineer about the plans. Um, I'm under the impression that the existing drain piped into Walbridge already and that it's grandfathered in. Um, it just seems to me that any water coming from new drains piped into the manhole at the end of Birch would bring a tremendous flow during these storm times coming off of a pavement surface and keep that end of wall bridge flooded for longer periods of time. So that's my one concern. Um, my suggestion and our suggestion was to raise the grade of the handicapped access ramp, close it off, and potentially close off that entire entrance with some type of berm to keep the water in the park and not spilling onto Wallbridge. I can show you pictures of it spilling at a rapid rate onto Wallbridge. Um, in the last 20 years, we've experienced rains from one to four inches. 
when ground is saturated in the spring due to high snow melt, um, and it really does create a huge problem. So I think more time to examine the plans, to talk about some modifications other than what were proposed tonight. Um, we also asked the questions about redirection of water toward the north, um, that whether that was investigated. Um, we weren't wholly satisfied, I don't think, as a group. Um, anyway, and then the last thing we want is for the park and our town to commit to clean these storm drains along Wallbridge that are clogged with, you know, tree leaves from the park um, in order to, you know, get maximum flow in what we have already. Um, so, and, and the last um, thing is that the dialogue with the MDC has to happen. Um, it should happen with the park, with the residents of Wallbridge and the MDC to figure out where this water can go and how fast we can get it into the storm drain system. And right now I know that there's a master plan with the seed study that they're working on, but I really think it needs to be addressed first before we even think about putting more water into what I think is an insufficient catch basin. I don't think that that's an, a, a foot and a half, 18 inches, when you have a parking lot that size to go into that. Uh, it, it, <laughs> I've lived here 20 years. Like, you can't convince me. So that's, that, with that, I'll wrap up my comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you. This is Kevin Erman, the chair again. Real, real quick, uh, I just, Mr. DeMay, I think, uh, address the, uh, the issue with the engineering report. But Mr. DeMay, could you uh, expand on that? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I did receive notice for some people watching. Um, they said that the report was hard to read on the on the screen. Um, I did update the website and I noted that that completed updated engineering report was added during the public hearing that we referenced. I just wanted uh, anyone from the public to have access to that along with the commission. It's on the website right now, so you can better see it than what was shared on the screen. I understand it was more difficult um, to see on the screen for the public. Thank you. This is Kevin Ahern again. Uh, all right, I'll turn back to the moderator for the next call. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will now unmute another line. All callers, please state your name now. Tim Cavello. Hi, Tim. It is your turn to comment. Please restate your name and provide your street address, and you may start your comments. Thank you. My name is Tim Cavello, C-O-V-E-L-L-O. -L -L -O. I live at 125 Walbridge Road in West Hartford. Uh, so at first I'd like to begin by thanking the Elizabeth, Elizabeth Park Conservancy for their stewardship of the park. They do a fantastic job, the board, the volunteers, um, everyone involved does a great job of keeping the park beautiful and making the park an asset, you know, tremendous asset for the greater Hartford community and for the neighborhood. So I just can't give them enough thanks for all that they do to make the park as beautiful as it is uh, and just, you know, a fantastic asset for, for everyone. Um, I'd also like to thank Chuck Corsi and Phil Barlow for all their efforts over the past couple of weeks. Uh, in advance of this hearing to help us better understand the plans and, and what's going on. So we really appreciate your, your reaching out to us. Really wanted to comment on two aspects of the proposal. And a lot of my concerns have been addressed through our conversations with Mr. Corsi and Mr. Barlow and in some of the conversations tonight. Um, but the first is just the lighting. Obviously, you know, this parking lot is close to, to Walbridge Road. And I was just concerned that the lighting not be intrusive to the neighbors on Walbridge Road, particularly those neighbors who live north of Birch towards the uh, northerly end of, of Walbridge Road. And my sense is that has been pretty well addressed through, through screening. Uh, I particularly like the notion of putting the lights on a timer so that they go off at, at 10 o'clock at night. That was new information tonight. So I appreciate that. And I think that's gonna help mitigate uh, our concerns around that. But the, the big concern, obviously, is the drainage, uh, which, you, which you've heard about. Um, and, and it's a challenge for everyone. That we live in, a, in a, a low area here. So this is an area that gets very wet, and it's not, you know, it might as well all be wetlands. You know, it's, at some point it probably was all wetlands. that was filled in at some point to create our neighborhood, to create aspects of the park. It's just a super wet area with poor drainage. And so, you know, everyone here constantly lives with, 
some pumps in their basement to keep their, their basements free of water on a regular basis. But I want to just comment and highlight the aspect that, that Kathy just mentioned, which is this flooding that occurs on a routine basis, typically about one to two times per year on Walbridge Road. And so when we have a significant rain event, you know, typically a, a, a severe thunderstorm or a more prolonged rain event, the area of Walbridge Road between Birch and Bainbridge floods, and it's concentrated particularly you know, around in the middle of our house to 127 in that area is kind of the, the deepest part of it. Um, and the bottom line is, is the existing storm sewer system cannot handle the volume of water that comes into this area during these rain events. And so, as Kathy mentioned, during these events, Walbridge Road becomes impassable. Water kind of comes up halfway into our front yards. You can't come or go from your driveway. You have to walk. And, you know, I've taken taxis to the airport because I can't get out of my own driveway during some of these events, uh, trudging through neighbor's yards to, to get to the taxi on, on Bainbridge Road. So, it's, you know, it's a real issue, and it's, again, symptomatic of of just the, the low level of this of this area, and the fact that the this, this system was, you know, probably the original system built in, in the 1920s, just not a great system. So, so you know, it's a problem that, that we have to uh, endure. When the, when the flooding occurs, the water backs up into the basements of the adjoining house, and so we all have elaborate sump pumps to help pump this out. And sometimes the sump pumps can keep up, at least at our house. Other times, the sump pump can't keep up, and the water just backs up, and suddenly your basement's flooded. Um, and obviously, if there's a power failure, then we have no sump pump, and you know, the basement just floods. So it's, it's a little bit of a mess. So there's, there's a sensitivity <laughs> by the neighbors to drainage concerns. Um, and you've heard the gist of what has been proposed is essentially moving water from this particular site south and west to the existing stormwater system on Walbridge Road, which is not a sufficient system. It is a defective system. And so it, it, cert it begs certain questions, all of which have been uh, addressed to some degree tonight. The first of which is, is there a way, rather than moving the water south and west to a defective stormwater system, is there a way to move the water north and east into the ponds or into a different drainage system. And, and it sounds like, you know, for, for topographical reasons, that can't be done. But I just wonder, has that really been fully explored? Is, is there a way to affect that? Obviously, water flows that way. That's, that's the easy thing. Just, just make the water flow down the way it goes, but it's going down into a system that just doesn't, that can't handle it. So is there a way that is there another way to take this drainage from this, from this site and move it north and east rather than south and west? Wanted to talk about the aspect of the proposal that deals with this little quality water basin and then taking the overflow of that onto Walbridge Road. Really, you know, not through a underground sewer, but through overland and down the gutter, down to the storm drains that are in front of 127 Walbridge just seems a little messy. Um, those storm drains, Kathy's out there all the time taking debris off those storm drains so that, so that they work. Um, they're often covered with debris. They're often clogged. It's just not, you know, it could work, um, but it just, just doesn't seem like the best. So we've, you know, we, we've, in our conversations with Chuck and Mr. Barlow, we, you know, we talk about ways that we could eliminate that aspect of things. And, you know, one of the notions was, was described tonight, creating more berms, which puts more pressure on the wetlands, um, closing the entrance to the park. I think, I think that footpath at the end of Birch, that should be closed only as a last resort. Because I do think, you know, it, it does, it, it solves th this problem, but that path is one of three paths that people use from the neighborhood, and even people who come and park on Walbridge use these paths to access, uh, gain access to the park. 
two are kind of formal in nature, which is the one at the end of Birch. There's another more formal one at the end of Bainbridge, and I call them formal simply because they have you know, a concrete ramp or a few bricks that lead to a dirt path, but they're, you know, they're pretty rough. Then there's a, in front of our house, there's basically a path that people have just created themselves, um, given the fact that there's a, there's a break in the bushes there, and um, it's not so wet there. But uh, I think closing that path is, you know, I think there's a lot of people in the neighborhood, Birch and West, who use that path to get to the park. So I think, again, that should be done as a last resort. It's a good idea to help solve this water problem, but it should be done as a last resort. Um, obviously, right, this is, this is an issue with the NBC. They really need to solve this problem um, for the neighborhood. I, you know, I think if, if we didn't have the a defective stormwater system here, this wouldn't be a problem, right? These are, you know, looking at this project in isolation, the, the project's a good project, right? Everyone, you know, I like the idea of a parking lot cleaning up the park. You know, again, everyone's well-intentioned here to make the park a better and nicer place, but I'm just concerned that the solution is taxing a system that is deficient right now. It's just It just doesn't work. So obviously, the best solution is to fix the deficient system, which is to get the NBC out here and say, guys, fix this drainage system so that when we have these events, uh, we don't have floods. Um, and then I just want to end with one last question, which is there's been lots of discussion about the water flow diminishing, in particular as a result of this berm being created. Um, I'm wondering, does that notion encompass the water that, will flow from the new catch basin and the sewer pipe uh, you know, and into, into the storm sewer, i.e. the underground flow of water? Or are we just talking about the overland flow of water when we hear that the, uh, the, the water is going to diminish? So with that, I thank everyone for your time and concern. And again, everyone, everyone's well-intentioned here, right? Everyone's, it, this is, the park is trying to do a great job and it's a great asset. It's just we, you know, it's a tricky area to maneuver through given uh, the low-level nature of the area. So it has to be managed and thought through very carefully. Thank you. I believe that is all the public callers. Thank you. Uh, okay, again, this is Kevin Ahern, the chair. Uh, so we have received all of the public comment uh, on this hearing. So I will turn now back to the applicant uh, to address the concerns that were expressed. Uh, who amongst the applicant wishes to begin? This is Brian. I can reiterate some discussion from other, other people also, uh, other members of your commission regarding the bringing the storm water back to the pond if you if you're looking at and i look at the maps the the low point of the water quality basin is uh well it's a high point where it's getting relief at about 125 elevation where the road around the park to the east is up about 130 or so so we can't, if I'm piping water, I've got to be below grade. So I got to be deeper than 125. I'm 10 feet below. I can't get to the pond and, and I don't have the pond elevation or do I? Water of the pond is 126. Water, water surface in the ponds at elevation 126. So that's already above the outflow from the water quality basin. So I can't get the water that flowed into the water quality basin up into the, the big pond. And I think we've done a lot by forcing some of the over land flow. This is all flow that's it's in those calcs that show that I, where I show the decrease in the flows. It's all the same water, whether it's in a closed system or it's flowing on top of the ground. Um, like I said, I think we're doing a lot. We're, we're uh, 
showing a 20 to 30% decrease in the flows over the course of the two year storm up to the 100 year storm. Those are the storms that we typically look at. Um, so I think we've done a lot to try to help with the problem, but the park isn't, and, and people identified it. It's an MDC town issue to resolve the, the capacity issues of the, the street drainage system at some point. But I think, and I feel comfortable in saying that we go forward with this project, we'll see less water. We're not gonna remove it. I can't, I'm not, I can't say that. But we're gonna see less water flowing down to that low point in Wallbridge Road post-construction, if this were allowed to be go forward. Thank you. This is uh, Kevin Hearn, the chair again, uh, to the extent that the applicant wishes to further uh, address any of the comments uh, that were made. Yes, please, Mr. Hay. This is Mary DeHaze for the record. I just wanted to, uh, you know, wrap up by saying that, you know, again, what Brian reiterated is that, you know, we're, we're improving the drainage on to Wallbridge um, and that, you know, we're reducing the over the, the runoff by 20 to 30%. Um, and that, you know, we do recognize that the, Drainage issues on Wallbridge are, um, you know, an MBC, MDC in town issue, but, you know, we are responsible and, you know, we'll be happy to work with MDC and continue discussions if, you know, there, there's a need for that. We're not trying to ram it down and anyone, you know, we want to be responsible here and make sure everyone's happy with you know, what we're, we're doing and proposing. Thank you, Ms. Hayes. Uh, do we have, yes, so, so questions from the panel. Uh, Mr. Bighorse first. I do have uh, one additional question for uh, Brian Cunningham. The, the water that is gonna be going just north of the footpath um, and discharging next to that utility pole that's going to just emanate onto Wallbridge Road. Uh, where is there a catch basin that that's going to, or is it just daylight onto the road as surface runoff? And where does it wind up? You're muted. Oh, I think we hit the button at the same time, <laughs> the moderator and myself. Uh, the water flows into the gutter, the side of the road and it flows to the south to the low point. There are no other catch basins in that stretch of wall bridge today. So it just flows into the street and it flows down the, the side of the road to the catch basins at the low point further down to the south. Um, so based on just looking at the plan, I'm looking at civil number five, it looks like the nearest catch basins that would flow to or maybe 150 feet to the south? Uh, it sounds about right, yeah. Um, and according to the residents, we get a lot of flooding at that end of the handicap ramp uh, right next to where you're proposing to put that water. Uh, yet just, you know, 30 or 40 feet to the north, you're doing a curb cut to connect it, uh, your drain pipe from the yard drain uh, in the maintenance yard right to the storm sewer system. Wouldn't it make sense to put that water in there? That's another way to work through a problem. I'd be concerned with, uh, I don't know. Yeah, it's possible. I don't know if that would be desirable with the current state of the storm sewer system to force that water into the system at that point. Um. I mean, it's going to wind up in the storm sewer system either way. Uh, we're just creating a, a shorter distance for it and not potentially creating more flooding near the end of that footpath. I still think you're going to have, you're going to, the, I'd be concerned about the capacity of the storm drainage system. Um, I don't know if I have a, 
I don't know if I have a size readily available to me. I don't offhand. Um, I, I I would rather it flow surface than force it into the storm drainage system and potentially cause other problems with the storm system at this end of the system. We might find that the pipe going from the south, going south from that manhole, doesn't have, isn't big enough. I, I, I haven't looked at it. I can't tell you for certain one way or the other, but I would be concerned about that, overtaxing that, the pipe, the sewer system at that point, rather than a known point down where it's just surface flow. Uh, again, just, you know, similar to my earlier question, is that something you guys would be willing to look at um, provided the piping was sufficient to carry the additional flow? I suppose, suppose we could. Suppose we could. I'd just be, like I said, I, I have reservations just from experience, but I haven't looked at the flows, so I couldn't tell you definitively it's a good idea or or it's not uh, understood and i do realize that there's probably a larger problem at play here and i'm not a stormwater engineer by any stretch just it would seem um it would seem a, a viable technique but I, I defer to the experts uh thank you for your uh time this is kevin Hearn, the chair again um and i I'd actually like to just under, see if I can understand the nature of the of the dialogue that just occurred in terms of uh, Mr. Binkhorst, maybe I'll ask you first. Uh, so what you would be proposing then is the water's going to end up in the same place. It's just how it gets there and trying to avoid it flowing across an already active area. Is that what you're trying to do or asking yeah. them to do perhaps? Uh, essentially correct. The water from their water quality basin is going to flow overland towards Walbridge Road and discharge over the curb adjacent to the footpath. Um, and then it's going to flow on just along the curb uh, about 150 feet to the south. Um, yet there is, uh, they're proposing a larger drainage connection um, just to the north of that into the storm sewer system. So it would prevent it from a flooding the area next to that footpath and be having to travel 150 feet down the street. Having said all that, I mean, uh, Mr. Cunningham makes a point. If the flow, if the piping from that catch basin is too small, then that perhaps isn't the most advisable. But again, I, I'm, there's probably larger issues at play here uh, with the whole drainage system and why it all backs up so frequently that need to be addressed at this might not make any difference at all. I don't know. Well, let me, this is Kevin Hearn, the chair again. Let me just then uh, just, because you seem to be sort of, uh, you both seem to be edging towards what looked like to me, some type of condition, and then you backed off. Um, I just want to make sure that that is the state of things. Or were you heading towards asking that a condition, uh, some type of condition be hammered out uh, in which they could potentially do what you were inquiring about? Uh, it would be my um, inclination to ask for that to be evaluated as a condition and if it were viable for them to do it. All right, let me follow up on this is Kevin Hearn again, um, just in what, uh, you know, just so we can put it in slightly more concrete terms. Um, you know, and maybe Mr. Cunningham, you could weigh in. Uh, what can be done uh, to make a determination as to whether that solution would be viable? Um, to the extent that we can, we can hold you to to at least uh, some some type of action. I'd like to have it a bit more concrete on the record. Well, Mr. Chairman, my concern is is that if I overtax the system at the manhole, I might adversely affect other catch basins at the Birch Road intersection that also go to that manhole and if that pipe is too small then the water is going to be forced 
up through the uh, catch basins and could potentially add to some flooding that's not experienced today at the intersection. Um, again, that's a, that's a, a, there's a known problem with the storm drainage system out there. I'd be leery, I'd be leery about putting excess flow in the system that high up, that close to the terminus of the system. I mean, that's, you got three catch basins, I believe, tied into that manhole near the intersection, one on Wallbridge and two on Birch. Um, I mean, I don't know how well they work today, but I know the system down the road backs up, so I don't know if it affects that intersection or not. Um, by putting additional flow um, from the parking lot into that manhole could be the tipping point. I, I don't know. And, and that's an assessment that would have to get done. Um, I think it'd be better done by uh, the NBC, the owner of the system, uh, if when they do their assessment of the entire drainage system. I understand there's a study going on now. So this is Kevin Hearn, the chair again. Um, okay. Uh, just to the extent that, I mean, uh, we want the best solution to come out of this uh, that we can. Uh, and so if the best solution is what's proposed, then we go with what, you know, what's proposed if we are approve it. But if, if Mr. Vincourt's solution, which would, it, you know, it, it has a perceived advantage uh, based on what the, the comments we've received and insofar as it would potentially take water away from, um, uh, you know, the ground, an area that is already troublesome. But as you've said, it could cause more problems. Is there something that this application, this applicant can promise to do to not blow your budget, but also figure out a way to make the determination um, that at least in your professional opinion, you can say, you know what, solution A is better than solution B, or you know what, actually solution B ends up being something we can do. Is there something that can be done? Well, I think, uh, hold on. I before, think... before you answer, Mr. Cunningham, real quick, uh, Mr. Dume just has a point. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as you're discussing the matter, uh, Mr. Commissioner Forrest and uh, Mr. Cunningham, um, let me see if this captures the issue and it might frame uh, Mr. Cunningham's response a little bit more. Um, so this would be something, you know, if it were to be imposed as a condition, that the applicant would perform additional stormwater analysis to see if a connection into the manhole, we have to specify the exact one we're talking about, can be made to receive the overland flow from the water quality basin. The additional analysis shall be submitted to the engineering division or MBC for their review and approval. If flow can be accepted without adversely impact affecting the drainage system, the applicant shall make the connection. Is that what you are trying to dance around here, Mr. Chairman? I I couldn't say that better myself. Nor could I. Mr. Cunningham, uh, so this is Kevin Hearn, the chair again. Would you yeah. consider that as a condition of approval? I don't. Again, I, I'm 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 concerned about you know somebody thinking that just by piping this overflow into the closed system is going to solve the problem. Um, I think the whole system is going to get the whole drainage system is due for some sort of an upgrade. At some point, I, I kind of think it'd be better to do it at a later time with an entire drainage system improvement project. I mean, we're, our numbers show a 20 to 30 percent decrease in the amount of water that's coming off the site after we go away. So already, we're lessening the amount of water that gets to that low point. So I, I think that's the best way to go at this point. Um, knowing that there's a, a larger initiative 
coming down the road uh, that would better address the entire system and putting all our ducks in the beginning of the drainage system is is less less desirable i i would say from our perspective uh again i think having less less flow than is coming out of off the park today yeah we'll have less uh, it's still going to go that way um but i don't think i don't know that that would be the I don't think that would, that condition would gain anything in in the in the large picture. Okay, well, thank you, Mr. Cunningham. Um, this is Kevin Hearn, the chair again. Uh, Mr. Bankhorst, to to that extent, do you have any follow up on this? Uh, no, I, I just would like to say I don't think this is going to solve all of the problems. I do, do think it, it it does address dumping you know, overflow from your stormwater basin right onto Wallbridge Road while it could go into the storm system uh, directly, which I think is an advantage. Uh, I do think that the condition that uh, Mr. Dumay um, crafted out does say that we, you know, want to evaluate to see that if it could take it um, without adverse conditions um, prior to actually doing it um, does uh, cover the proverbial, you know what, um, and so it's a, it's a make sure that it can do it and can accept it without adverse conditions. It's not to just stick it in there in the hopes that uh, nothing bad will happen. So I do think that um, the condition that Mr. Dumay crafted is uh, is advisable. Thank you, Mr. Makehorse. Uh, this is Kevin Hearn, the chair again. All right, I think we've uh, explored this one uh, sufficiently. Uh, do we have any other uh, follow-up questions? Do we have any other further comments from the applicant before we close this hearing? Okay, uh, I see no further comments from the applicant or questions from the commission. Okay, then at this point, uh, we will close this hearing. Thank you, everyone. So uh, we're going to move to uh, deliberation on uh, both applications that we've heard tonight. However, we're going to take a five minute recess. Thank you.
Uh, okay, everybody, we're ready to go back on. Just let Sorry. us know when, when we're ready to go. Mr. Chairman, we are all set and ready to go. Thank you, Uriah. All right, so uh, we are in the uh, deliberation portion now. We're going to uh, start with the, uh, the first application uh, on Kane Street. Uh, so I just want to note that uh, Ms. Gomes and Mr. Binkhorse are both seated on this application. Uh, and so uh, just to get things rolling uh, to start the discussion on this, uh, I'll entertain a motion on this item. Ms. Gomes. Mr. Chairman, I'd make a motion to approve application number 1123 for 25 Kane Street. Thank you, Ms. Gomes. And I'd like to note uh, that under present uh, conditions of the executive order, uh, we need only a motion and not a second at this point. Uh, so the motion is active. Uh, and so uh, any discussion uh, on this item? Ms. Gillette. I, I want to say that this application is a vast improvement on what we saw a couple of months ago. I'm glad the applicant is taking it seriously. The history gives um, a, a, a very interesting perspective on that low-level shelf. I've, I've walked this property a number of times. <clears throat> I'm glad to hear about the invasive uh, the invasive actions that they are taking about the Japanese knotweed, which frankly, now you can walk across on the northern bank in two months. It'll be eight feet tall. It's crazy. And now that it has more sun, there's more growing. I'm uh, I'm in I'm in favor of this as a correction to what was there before. I, I would like to ask that um, formally that the figure two uh, issue, the labeling of figure two to the plan C 2.1 be formally included because part of that is the follow-up and it refers to that, that plate. And I'd also like to just put in the record that we had asked um, we had asked the last time we saw this about whether there had been any reports to police or other town officials about homeless encampments that are mentioned frequently in the report and that the town had none. I just want that to be reflected in the in the record. Um, other than that, I this is a vast improvement, a vast improvement over what we had seen before, and uh, it'll. I'm very much, very much in favor of their follow-up three-year, 100% woody, woody plant survey issues that things have actually taken root and are being maintained. I, I think this is a, a model of what we ought to look at with other applications. And so I'm going to be voting yes. Thank you, Ms. Gillette. Uh, Mr. Dumais, I saw your hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, piggybacking off a comment Commissioner Gillette just made, I'd like to ask the maker of the motion uh, if they would like to include um, standard set of conditions that we apply to all inland wetland permits, just for the record. Those typically are the following plans of record incorporated by reference in this permit. Number two, wetland permits subject to full compliance with the town erosion and sediment control requirements, and that they shall be installed and maintained in accordance with the 2002 Connecticut guidelines for soil erosion and sediment control. Weekly inspection reports of the sediment erosion control should so be submitted to the town planner. Additional erosion sediment control measures shall be implemented and or installed throughout the course of construction as or if deemed necessary by the director, uh, by the design engineer or West Hartford town officials. Prior to the start of any site disturbance, all sediment erosion controls and tree protection 
shall be installed once installed, but before the commencement of any disturbance, the town planner shall be notified and provided the opportunity to inspect. Five, the agency shall receive any copies of all materials and correspondence permits received from DEEP uh, to the extent there are any. Um, this last one, the uh, final completion uh, addresses Commissioner Gillette's comment, uh, final completion of work report, which certifies the removal of invasive species and installation of proposed native plantings as shown on the planting plan sheet C 2.1 prepared by a qualified professional shall be submitted to the town planner. Additionally, as offered by the applicant, biannual inspection reports shall be provided documenting the restorations plans success for a period of three years. Lastly, this permit shall expire if not exercised within five years from the date of issuance or the date of any final resolution or legal action challenging the permit. It shall not be assigned, transferred, sublet, or sold to any other person without written permission of the agency. Uh, Commissioner Gomes, for the record, yes, Mr. Dumay, I would like to incorporate those uh, standard conditions into my motion. Thank you. This is Kevin Hearn, the chair again. Thank you, Ms. Gomes. Uh, do we have any further comment on this application? Uh, yeah, I would just like to note that I, I agree uh, with Mr. Gillette. I do think this is, you, you've come a long way, baby, as it were. I think this uh, this is a nice looking application. I think they've, uh, they've taken what was an unfortunate situation. And, and, uh, all right. Well, then, uh, let me try your minds. I just want to note uh, that all votes uh, and this forum will be taken by roll. Mr. DeMay, will you please call the roll? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. DeMay, uh, Commissioner Binkhorst. Yay. Commissioner Gomes. Yay. Commissioner Gillette. Yay. Mr. Chairman Ahern. Aye. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, the wetlands permit is found to be in compliance with sections 10.2 and 10.4 of your standards and criteria for decision making of the wetland permit <laughs> approved. Thank you, Mr. Dume. All right, uh, then uh, next up, uh, we're going to move on to item number five. This is the uh, Inland Wetland application. This is the map amendment. So we're considering uh, five, six, and seven separately. Uh, and so uh, on the map amendment, uh, I'll entertain a motion on this item. Ms. Gomes. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to approve application IWW number 1121 for 1563 Asylum Avenue, excuse me, Elizabeth Park. Thank you, Ms. Combs. Uh, do we have any comment, uh, any discussion regarding this item? Ms. Gillette. I, it, it speaks for itself. And I will vote to accept this based on, on what the, so I, I'm a little disturbed at the scope that was used to consider for this application in terms of what the impact is. And wetlands ought to have been marked in a different configuration, which would have better reflected more of the surrounding area that is impacted by the water. But to the extent that the map marked what it marked, I, I concur. Thank you, Ms. Gillette. Uh, any further comment? No. Right. Seeing none. Uh, let me try your minds on this application. All those in favor, Mr. Dumay, please, uh, sorry, Mr. Dumay, please take the roll. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dumay, for the record, Commissioner Binkhorst. Aye. Commissioner Gomes. Aye. Commissioner Gillette. Aye. Mr. Chairman Ahern. Aye. And with that, the application Inland Wetland 1121 Wetland Map Amendment is approved. All right, uh, so next up is item number six. Uh, so we have six and seven. Uh, item number six is the Inland Wetland uh, application. Um, uh, Inland Wetland 1122 for Elizabeth Park. Uh, I'll entertain a motion on this item. 
Ms. Gomes? I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, was that Ms. Gomes or? Ms. Gomes. That was me. For the record, Commissioner Gomes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to approve application IWW number 1122 for 1563 Asylum Avenue, Elizabeth Park. Um, however, I'd like that motion to reflect not only our standard conditions of approval imposed on uh, these applications, but also two additional conditions of approval that were discussed throughout the public hearing, um, which Mr. Dume may be better able to phrase than I. Um, I think that the first condition of approval should be the evaluation of discharging into the manhole in lieu of uh, surface flowing by the footpath. I will leave the precise language to Mr. Dume and Mr. And Commissioner Binkhorst. And uh, I believe that the, also, the second condition of approval shall also be the renovation of the yard drain behind the maintenance building. Thank you, Ms. Combs. Uh, Mr. Dume, just before uh, we go to any discussion, can you just confirm the, uh, the conditions there uh, were accurately reflected? Yes, those are the two I had noted. Uh, it was the renovation and maintenance of the yard drain uh, in the maintenance yard. That's one. And then uh, the condition that I had read to perform additional analysis to see if a connection into the manhole can be made to receive overland flow from the water quality basin. The additional analysis shall be submitted to the engineering division slash MBC for their review and approval. If flow can be accepted without adversely affecting the drainage system, the applicant shall make the connection. This is Kevin Hearn, the chair again. Thank you, Mr. DeMay. Uh, do we have any comment on this inland wetlands application? Mr. Lepp. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Chillett. Thank you, Chairman Ahern. I, I don't think this project is going to make anything worse. I think by adding the berm on the northern end, it may, the models say, make it better. This is a lost opportunity. And I think we see these all over the place. Elizabeth Park is a botanical garden. This area where they're dealing with stormwater runoff is right next to a wetlands area. Expand the wetlands area, create a wetlands garden. Why do you have a walkway that isn't a bridge over to Wall Bridge as opposed to a, a runway a funnel to move the water out. I just see this as a real lost opportunity. I, it, we've got to look more imaginatively at dealing with stormwater runoff. Simply saying, well, it goes in a pipe and it goes away is, is not good enough anymore. And I, I just think there's a very real missed opportunity here in terms of an area and a resource, I, it, it's just too bad. But it doesn't make things worse than they already are on Wallbridge. So I'm compelled to vote yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gillette. Uh, this is Kevin Hearn, the chair again. Uh, do we have any other further comment uh, on this item? I do not. Uh, thank you, Mr. B. Of course, uh, Ms. Gomes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner Gomes, for the record, I, I, I tend to agree with Commissioner Gillette. I think that uh, while the uh, flow rates on site improve and overall this is a general improvement to the area, it is a missed opportunity to, um, to do a host of things that come to mind and it is a little bit disappointing that um, it seems that the applicant did what needed to be done to reduce rates, but then didn't take that extra step to uh, to educate the community about the importance of wetlands or or anything along those lines. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Combs. Um, yes, I, I think I'd like to follow up on, on what, what, what's been said here. And I think that every time we get an inland application in which there is a great deal of discussion surrounding uh, flooding, um, you know, once we actually have to sit down and take the vote, yes, our uh, authority is, you know, circ circumscribed uh, to what the Inland Wetlands uh, uh, applications, uh, you know, what we can do on such applications. However, um, you know, often I find us able to accomplish a heck of a lot more than what the regulations limit us to uh, on these types. And, you know, I, I suppose on this one, I want to celebrate that something's been done. Um, and, and, you know, and frankly, though, uh, a lot of it is uh, due to the, the efforts of uh, town staff um, pushing. Um, you know, we ended up with a berm that we didn't have uh, until the engineering department got involved. Um, you know, and so I, I appreciate that. And I don't, I don't want to bash the applicant. I think that the applicant uh, came along and, and got there. And so, and, and, and uh, Elizabeth Park is, has been a good partner. Um, but, you know, yes, I think there was opportunity to do more, um, but I think that, 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 you know, we've gone as far as we can on this. Um, all right, well then, uh, if there's any, uh, no further discussion, then uh, I will try our uh, minds on this item. Uh, Mr. Dumay, please call the roll. Mr. Chairman, this is Mr. Dumay. Commissioner Binkhurst. Aye. Commissioner Gomes. Aye. Commissioner Gillette. Aye. Mr. Chairman Ahern. Aye. With that, Mr. Chairman, the Wetlands Agency finds application Inland Wetland 1122 to be in compliance with Section 10.2 and 10.4 standards and criteria for its decision making, and the application is approved. Thank you, Mr. Dumay. Again, this is Kevin Ahern, the chair. Uh, finally, item number 71563, Asylum Ave. 1355. I'll entertain a motion on this item. No, Ms. Combs got there first. <laughs> Ms. Combs, please. Sorry, Commissioner Gillette. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I'd like to make a motion on application SUP number 1355 for 1563 Asylum Avenue. I'd like to make a motion to approve this application. Thank you, Ms. Combs. Uh, all right, Mr. DeMay has oh. a motion carries and, and is found uh, favorably approval by the commission. The applicant would be required in two years to to come back in front of the commission to see if any additional conditions are warranted at that time. So perhaps at that time, other conditions could be made if there's something that's found um, wrong with with the improvements. Thank you. Commissioner Gomes, for the record, absolutely, Mr. Dumay, my motion includes our standard conditions, particularly the look back period. Thank you, Ms. Gomes. Again, this is uh, the chair. Uh, chair recognizes Liz Gillette. This is a win. This is a win. I'm so excited. We saved the trees. Um, I, I am so pleased that we've been able to find the compromise that we had and that the bridge was open to the suggestions with uh, moving the the driveway. Mr. Gillette, um, I'm just going to stop you there. We are voting I, on the SUP, uh, the last item for Elizabeth Park. Hold that thought oh, for the oh. next application. Sorry, I'm you, out. You look way too happy about that one. Um, no, I, I will say in terms of the SUP that they need more parking space and that they're not parking on the lawn in the wetlands is a good thing. So it's good that they are creating a additional appropriate parking area. Thank you, Ms. Gillette. I appreciate it. Um, okay, so any other further comments on the SUP? Seeing none, let me try your minds. Mr. DeMay, please take the roll. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Binkhurst. Uh, I vote to approve. Commissioner Gomes. Aye. Commissioner Gillette. Aye. Mr. Chairman Ahern. Aye. With that, the application SUP 1355 is approved. Thank you, Mr. Dumay. This is Kevin Ahern again. Thank you to everyone who presented tonight. Uh, I, we appreciate the, the time that you put in. Um, 
So at this point, uh, the commission is going to move on to uh, item number eight, the town council referral. Now, uh, we took this up at the beginning of the meeting. However, I believe we had some broadcast issues. Uh, and so I would appreciate it if the town planner would um, restate his presentation uh, for us and for anyone still listening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the record, Todd May, town planner. Uh, this is a referral application, 1021-1023 Farmington Avenue app application on behalf of the Bridge Family Center, contract purchaser of property known as 1021-1023 Farmington Avenue, requesting a change of the underlying zone from approximately 0.21 acres of land on the south side of Farmington Avenue from RM3 residence to RO residence office and a special development district designation overlay for the reuse of the existing building for professional office, office use. This application was originally on our March 3rd agenda, I'm sorry, March 2nd agenda, back when we were obviously meeting in person. Um, at that time, during your deliberations, you were earlier than normal in this process for referral, meaning that our design review advisory committee had not had an opportunity to review and provide feedback and comments, nor had staff completed its staff review. Since that time, um, the applicant has gone to the design review advisory committee a few times and they received favorable recommendation on the design. Uh, DRAC noted that the design is a fitting architectural response and also a site planning response to this transitional corridor along Farmington Avenue. Staff has completed all of its reviews and found no technical issues outstanding with the application. What staff did do was transmit your comments um, and concerns about the application during your previous review period back in March. And just for a recap, those comments and concerns were, um, you were overall comfortable with the concept of using the RO zone as a tool. You thought it was a good transitional land use tool that has been successfully used within this exact neighborhood and also in other areas north and south of the center. But you were somewhat concerned with the STD component um, and those were site plan issues. Your concerns were largely around um, the lack of thought to preserving existing trees. There are several large mature trees, two, at least two trees in the front of the property and a small stand of trees at the rear of the property. There was a lack of adequate buffer. Uh, you felt that there was a lack of um, thought to include other techniques to mitigate the amount of impervious coverage on the site, and you asked the applicant to explore those issues further. Um, since that time, um, the plans before you, you should see that the applicant has done that. Um, they reduced the overall driveway width by several feet. They shifted the driveway in to preserve the three trees um, in the front. The driveway that's shared with the dentist office, two properties to the east, was also reduced by upwards of seven feet in places in its width um, and converted to some pervious pavers to accommodate uh, additional, imper additional pervious coverage. Additional landscaping and screening was installed or proposed to be installed along the Western property boundary. That buffer in particular was increased from near zero um, up to five feet. Um, there was a stand of mature vegetation along the south southern property border um, that was preserved. The trees were preserved there. And there was additional impervious paver, uh, pervious paver included in the application. I would note that at the time you looked at the architecture, the architectural plans included vinyl um, shingling at the upper levels of the building. The DRAC had looked at that and asked that the applicant consider a wood product, which is more in keeping with the character of the historic building in this corridor of Farmington Avenue. The, applica the applicant agreed to that and the plans before you um, include that architectural de detail of wood with that, I'm going to conclude my summary. I think I captured the big picture issues that were concerned raised by the TPZ at the last review. Um, available to answer any questions. Uh, this is the chairman again. Uh, so for purposes of discussion, uh, we'll entertain a motion uh, on this item. And, and uh, Ms. Gillette, please. I'd like to entertain a motion to approve this application. To clarify, that would be a recommend uh, a motion to recommend approval. Yes, to recommend strongly. Any comment, Ms. Gillette? I'm so excited about this. I can't tell you this. I think this is terrific, and I I think the bridge up and down 
for their cooperation. I it, saving those trees in front it, it maintains the residential character as opposed to an office that you built that looks like a house. It's a house. I, I'm thrilled that they were receptive to it, and I think it 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 goes hand in hand with we need to look at our parking formulas and regulations and what we're asking um because i think we ask people to put far too much parking in some places so i'm just thrilled with this i think this is wonderful and i think the use is is perfectly appropriate and i'm just delighted with how this has come out thank you thank you miss gillette uh, do we have any comments or questions for Mr. Dumay? None. Seeing none. All right. Uh, I agree with Ms. Gillette. I believe we've, uh, I actually, it was really great that we made a big difference on this one. And I'm really glad that we had the opportunity to see this early, send our comments in and see the results of, of those. So this was a nice process. I appreciate it. All right. Uh, well, then with that, uh, let me try your minds. Mr. Dumay, please call the roll. Commissioner Binkers. Aye. Commissioner Gomes. Aye. Commissioner Gillette. Aye. Mr. Chairman Ahern. Aye. With that, the recommendation to the council recommending approval of the STD application carries. Thank you, Mr. Dumay. Do we have anything further? I, I do have one item to note under town planner's report, and this was at the request of, of you, Mr. Chairman, and Commissioner Gomes, just to provide the commission with an update. Um, late yesterday evening, uh, Governor Lamont issued a new executive order that deals with outdoor activities, um, the way it's most impactful or of interest to our planning and zoning commission um, is that it, it really deals with outdoor dining uh, and it changes the process and the regulatory approval authority um, in West Hartford's case from by and large the Planning and Zoning Commission to um, a local enforcement official. Um, it also provides for uh, flexibility and modifications for restaurants to uh, expand their outdoor dining areas um, into adjacent, into or onto nearby properties, uh, into sidewalks, into public rights of way with appropriate review and approvals. Um, the town is reviewing this process and, and we're hoping to come up with a permitting process that largely mimics um, what we currently um, do for our reviews, just in a much more expedited fashion. The order uh, basically says once we receive an application under this process, we have 10 days in which to approve the request or it's deemed approved under the executive order. There is a unique appeals process um, on an approval, um, specifically one that was you know, conditioned um, that identifies the Planning and Zoning Commission as the, um, I guess, um, I'm sorry, correct me if I'm wrong, Commissioner Gomes, you guys would be the, the de facto ZBA in that instance. That's that's essentially what they turned you into for a request to appeal. Um, this could be by, by an applicant or um, an adjoining property or budding property owner. So there are a lot of changes in foot. This is gonna be a very fluid situation um, that we're hoping to um, come up with a permitting process. Um, earlier this evening before this meeting, I worked with our economic development specialist and we sent out a survey to 113 of the restaurants in town. It's about 72, 73% of all the restaurants that we have on file. Um, we asked them a series of questions about um, out their intentions to reopen outdoor dining under the state's guidance. Uh, the state also issued parallel guidance that requires the outdoor dining areas um, to provide certain buffer and separation distances, six feet separation between chairs and tables, um, plus a whole series of other uh, operational uh, concerns. And it requires restaurants to only be opened outdoors. That's what's driving some of the executive order allowing restaurants to permit flexibility in, their, in, in how they can expand. Um, so that survey went out earlier this evening. I'm just checking my, my response inbox. We already received about 20% uh, responses on that. So I'll be interested to see what the interest is with our restaurateurs and what their intentions are in terms of reopening. Um, 
I can certainly report back more, and I think that I will with the commission. I would like to get your feedback and input on our permitting um, application uh, once we develop it before it goes live, and then uh, certainly touch base with uh, the, the full commission uh, at the program on, on furloughs, and, and we get an idea of how many permits we're issuing, who's getting what, um, and keep you in the loop. But I can answer any questions you might have. Commissioner Gomes? No, Ms. Gillette. Am I? Okay. I, I, I just have one thing to add, Mr. Dume. You mentioned, if I heard correctly, that the appeals by the applicant come to the TPZ, which is correct. The order is silent as to appeals from the approval of such a permit by a neighbor or an opponent. So my reading of the order is that if a neighbor or opponent appeals, it follows the traditional appeals process, which in a lot of towns from a decision of the ZEO goes straight to the ZBA. And depending on what the ZBA finds, goes straight, you can take it to court. So th that's an interesting um, discrepancy where there's a specified appeals process just for applicants to come to the planning commission to the TPZ in West Hartford. But opponents or neighbors are going the traditional route. Thanks. Uh, and uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could just uh, respond to Commissioner Gomes. Yes, please. The appeals also is somewhat unique in that I think, and, and I'll, I'll lean on Commissioner Gomes' reading of, of the order, um, does not require the commission to hold a public hearing for the appeal, which is somewhat unique on, on this type of an appeal process. So I, I, I think it's somewhat silent. Does that mean it would be a potential a public meeting where you essentially are reviewing the papers uh, associated with the approval and then the appeal? I don't know. Um, hopefully we don't have those, but um, that is a unique um, component of the order. Uh, for the record, Commissioner Gomes, Agreed, Mr. Dume. The order specifically suspends any public hearing requirement for such an appeal. Uh, so it would be just a regular meeting. No public notice would be required. Thank you, Mr. Dume. Uh, thank you, Ms. Gomes. This is Kevin Hearn again. Um, Ms. Gillette. Hey. I heard about this last night. Anyway, I, I just would like to say, and I trust and believe that we will move forward in whatever way possible, pick our actions as they currently are, affording as much public uh, participation in appeals, as much leeway and understanding as we do currently and hope that this is over really soon because i don't like the idea of the appeals process and getting rid of the zba and, I, I, and most of our restaurants are in 20 foot slots they don't have sidewalk to space out so it's not I just, I hope things go back to normal soon. And my vote is to try to mimic what we do on a very standard basis as much as possible. Um, I don't like it. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Lyon. And, and I, you know, I think it is important to note that any approvals that occurred through this process uh, last only as long as the governor's emergency. And so, you know, the, the carriage turns into a pumpkin uh, the second those orders are over. And, you know, none of those uh, decisions become permanent for us. Uh, and so, you know, you still have to go through the normal process once things retreat back to normal. Uh, Mr. Dume. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you, Mr. Dume, for the record. Um, yes, the, the first part of the order does provide for a municipality to um, amend their regulations uh, through zoning amendments, regulations, ordinances uh, in an expedited fashion. Um, it's my understanding there might be a community or two looking to um, do that after they get their program up and running within the state um, to actually extend the approval period uh, in anticipation that the executive order might terminate sometime in the early fall to provide a, a bridge coverage, if you will, or gap coverage to, to take these permittees that get issued a permit under this order 
through the end of the season. I know some communities are contemplating doing that because they're a little concerned about um, what would happen if, if the governor uh, removes this uh, or, or, or dials this back sometime this summer or early fall, and all of a sudden there's a mass shift in all the outdoor dining seats. So we're trying to provide more flexibility. That might be something we consider. I don't know, but that would have to go back through a, a formal amendment process, I think. Ms. Dillette, question? I, I I think New Haven may be the same way. I think Hartford may some areas. We have a different restaurant culture than Simsbury with the Simsbury House, et cetera. It, it's different. And whatever we can do to make um, our restaurants happier, more successful, more predictable, more stable, uh, I would love to hear suggestions and would definitely stand behind. Thank you, Ms. Gillette. Uh, any other questions for the now plan? Okay. Uh, then I will entertain a motion to adjourn this hearing. Again, we're going to have to take that motion by roll. Ms. Gomes. Damn. Meet ya. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I'd make a motion to adjourn this meeting. Let me try your minds. Mr. Dumet, please take the roll. Commissioner Binkhorst. Commissioner Gomes. Aye. Commissioner Gillette. Aye. And Mr. Chairman Ahern. Aye. With that, the TPZ special meeting of Wednesday, May 13th is now closed. Thank you, everybody.